everyone, and welcome. Actually, I'll just change this up real quick. Uh, here we go. We got the big one. Uh, hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to Nice Last Call. My name is Derek Melinda. Um, we are uh, we're back. We're Thursday, and it's been a really, 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 really long week. Um, I've been uh, busy at work. I've been uh, busy... Um, finishing up a big, huge table uh, that I've been working on for a client, a uh, customer. Uh, I take these woodworking projects, and uh, I basically just take the money that I make from them, and I use that to put back into the channel. Um, some of our first equipment and cameras and stuff were paid for by uh, uh, paid for by uh, my woodworking projects. But I have one done, and uh, I. It's been a it's been a very very long week, so looking forward to the weekend. Um, and yeah, so um, the alg <laughs> the algorithm bought me here. Well, that's great here, John, Philip, Dan. Great to see everybody. Now, of course, uh, as you can see by the thumbnail uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about Legend of the Five Rings. Um, and so I assume that that means we're going to have maybe twenty people in here, um, because quite frankly. Uh, you know, um, all anybody ever cares about is uh, Dungeons and Dragons, uh, Fifth Edition, in particular one D and D now, um, and uh, dropping off precipitously from that, you have your uh, uh, Pathfinder Two, and uh, then there's everything else, um, fighting for existence. Um, so, you know, uh, there's a couple of uh, mad lad content creators out there who try to. Uh, make an impact so uh, with other games. So we're going to try to do that too. And the reason that I can do that uh, is because screw YouTube. That's why. Um, <laughs> I should, I should, John, I should change the title <laughs> to is L5R better. Is L5R better than D&D &D 5E? Um, I should. Um, um, that would be pretty good. Yeah, there we go. Combine it with one D&D, &D, the one ring. Perfect. Perfect. You hit you hit all three check boxes in one go. Um, <laughs> the algorithm tricked me. I had to fight my way here. Great. Uh, well, I'm glad you made it, Stephen. Um, you know, but you know, one of the things that um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get to the characters and we'll get to Legend of Five Ring stuff, and also too, of course, uh, you know, if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to to let me know. Drop a comment or whatever below, or chat question. You know how it goes. Um, but we uh, recently, a lot of other content creators, I'm sure, you know, you've seen some other, uh, there were a couple of videos floating around our Patreon Discord. I'm sure you've also seen on the internet that a lot of content creators recently have been really lamenting the um, the YouTube algorithm. Not just, I'm not just talking about TTRPG people, but I'm talking about uh, just a lot of uh, uh, content creators have been talking about how the algorithm has been, you know, just killing them. And for, you know, some of these bigger uh, channels like, you know, Shedversity and... Um, uh, was it called Scalgum? You know, they rely on views because they're used to getting, uh, you know, 100,000 views, 200,000 views, uh, 300,000 views per video. And so that's how they make their money. Uh, and they have whole big, huge production staff. And so when YouTube suddenly gives you half as much um, views, you know, that's cutting your paycheck in half. We've been experiencing that too. Of course, only about 5% of this channel's income comes from YouTube views. Uh, the other 95% comes from our Patreon, and it comes from tips and super chats, and it comes from YouTube memberships, um, and you know, and, and even amidst, amidst all of that, you know, Patreon is a good 70, 80 percent of it, and of course, the people who are tipping and super chatting the most are also our patrons, um, and so that means that uh, you know, and so I'm always the the ever the cynical one. And I'm always the data person. I'm always trying to, you know, solve problems and issues. And, uh, you know, we were talking about this last night. And Mr. Smith, William Brandis, uh, ever so eloquently basically just said, you know, screw him. Um, I mean, he used more dirty language than that. But we're, we'll try not to get demonetized here really immediately. But, uh, you know, and, and like all things, uh, he was right. Um, because uh, YouTube is a platform that I use to reach new people, to, to, to bring, to find the diamonds in the rough, 
to find people who want to go deeper into RPGs, think more about role-playing games, have mature adult conversations about role-playing games. Um, and while I appreciate YouTube as a platform for finding those people, ultimately, I don't really care if I get views. Um, I'm really just interested in producing content that my patrons are going to enjoy. Uh, and, and apparently 69mega.com will enjoy. Um, but outside of that, uh, oh, wow, this is great. Um, they must have known we were talking about Legend of the Five Rings. Um, but yeah, so they, um, <laughs> the Russian bots have found us. <laughs> but uh, that, that's always a good sign of the stream. Um, but yeah, so here we are talking about Legend of the Five Rings. You know, uh, we'll talk about, we'll probably talk about D&D. We'll talk about Pathfinder 2. Um uh, probably more Pathfinder 2 than D&D. But I'm also going to talk about these uh, other uh, games that we I love, that uh, I'm passionate about, that I think some of you are interested in and passionate about as well. And, um, you know, together we'll, we'll sort of walk that bridge. And the fact of the matter is, it is far better for me to make a video or a live stream that keeps 20 or 30 or 40 of my paying Patreon members happy, satisfied, uh, than it is for me to create a video that, you know, gets me tens of thousands or 20,000 views. Um, and that will definitely be tonight. Um, <laughs> so in any case, um, yeah, don't get me wrong. Uh, you know, we, we, uh, YouTube is important and it's, it, we do need to find new viewers and we do need to find new subs and we do need to find new people to join the Patreon. After all, everyone here who joined the Patreon found us via YouTube somehow. And so it is important that we create content um, that is going to find people like you who have decided to come and hang out with us. But it's, uh, it's just, it's more important that I find the right people than I find the most people. Right. Does that make sense? Um, all right. Uh, so Dan asked a question. He said, are you, well, that's not it. Uh, there we go. Dan asked a question. He said, are you excited for the new L5R source book? He is talking about writ of the wilds, um, which is a long time coming. Uh, writ of the wilds is a book that covers the enigmatic dragon clan, as well as covering some of the, wilderness spaces of Rokugan, the forests, the mountains, um, going into a little bit detail of some of those areas um, of Rokugan. Um, I don't know. I actually don't really know too much about what is in it. Um, and I'm kind of, I kind of have a, a, a wonky relationship with the dragon clan. Kid Derek, Teenage Derek loved the Dragon Clan. Adult Derek isn't so sure that uh, that he thinks the Dragon Clan is the best um, clan. Um, so is it a lore book? No, 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 no. The, none of them, all of them are lore books and mechanics books. And um, all of them are just all of everything all at once. It's, a, it's, it's always a very good mix. Um, I think a lot of game systems could learn a thing or two from these books. Um, I always find them to be, uh, chock full of new techniques and new schools and new uh, uh, systems even sometimes. Uh, in fact, I think every book has uh, always focused on it has a system. Um, but, you know, um, in this case, as Dan is saying, um, you know, there aren't really wilderness travel or survival rules in any of the legend of the five rings core rulebook. That's not like a really important part of samurai, most samurai adventures, but uh, this is the, you know, this is a book that he said, Hey, we're going to include this system for, um, for uh, wilderness travel and wilderness overland system. Um, kind of like how the lion clan source book, which is called fields of battle uh, introduced a much more comprehensive, almost war game like uh, mass combat system to the legend of the five rings game system uh, because the, there's a mass combat system in the core rule book, uh, but it's mostly focused on like, you know, 
focused in on the PCs being these individual actors in a big mass combat that's kind of surrounding around them. They're not really the generals or the ones making the big decisions. Um, but the Lion Clan source book had a whole section um, about in-depth mass combat with sort of, you know, creating maps that have like areas, almost like a, you know, like a, an Axis and Allies or Risk type game where you're moving your armies and you're making, you're doing command checks and there's a whole system in there for uh, building up an army, requisitioning troops, calculating how veteran your units are. Like there's baggage trains and supply lines and this whole system, which is not in the core rule book, but they put it in there. Same thing with the uh, Crab Clan source book, which is called the Shadowlands, which goes into, you know, super detail about all of the nasty demons and Bakemono and all this other stuff that is in the Shadowlands. And it's got systems for the taint and jade and crystal and all of this stuff about de demonic possession and horror mechanics and corruption. Again, that's not in the core rule book because it's, you know, that's not going to be most campaigns. But if you're playing a crab based campaign centered around the wall, dividing the empire from the Shadowlands, then that stuff is going to be really important to you. And you're going to go uh, into pretty good, pretty, pretty de de deep with it. So um, welcome, Strat. You, you remembered for once. Good to see you here. Uh, Strat uh, uh, was a, a recent winner of our monthly Hero Point Award contest, where each month and quarter, um, we take the Patreon member who won or was awarded the most Hero Points from our Discord server, and the Knights of Last Call buy them a role-playing game book of their choice. And uh, uh, in this case, Strat has decided to go for a copy, a signed copy by all of the Knights of Root. Uh, so can't say that I'm not a little bit, uh, you know, uh, proud of that one. So Strat, good looking out, uh, book ordered and, uh, we'll get it signed and we'll get it on, on the way over to you. So that's pretty cool. That's pretty awesome. Um, da -da -da -da. Uh, John, I think it's a really great way of breaking up the books. Uh, we can go a little bit more into detail of it, but um, each book uh, typically focuses on one of the major clans where, um, uh, you know, uh, Crab for the Shadowlands, Crane for the Courts of Stone, Phoenix for the Celestial Realms, Lion for the Fields of Battle, and now Dragon for the uh, Rid of the Wilds. There's two more great clans. And then they usually introduce a minor clan in each book as well, uh, which is sort of like a, uh, you know, in Pathfinder 2 terms, it's like an uncommon uh, sort of ancestry, right? There are, there's the seven great clans, but then there's also probably a good two dozen or three dozen minor clans in the empire as well. Uh, and so each book kind of takes a little bit, it takes a chapter to do a deep dive into one of these minor clans. If you want to be something really specific and really um, interesting and unique. Um, and then there's new equipment and new techniques and all this other stuff. So very, very good. Uh, Ty says my last L5R character was dragon clans Miramoto school. Yeah. I mean, you know, listen, I mean, um, uh, Miramoto duelist. I mean, that's again, as I said before, young Derek loved the idea of the Miramoto school who is trained in the, you know, what is it, the, the twin heaven style of, you know, dual wielding the katana and the wakasashi. Uh, you know, that's like, oh, dual wielding katana and wakasashi. Like, teenage Derek, young Derek really, really, really like that. Um, older Derek, uh, Sometimes there's a hard time enjoying the Dragon Clan because I find them them to be too uh, monastic. They are they're too detached. They're too uninvolved, um, and that that can be a little bit uh, frustrating for to me a little bit. But all right, well, uh, as I said tonight, we are going to talk about character creation in Legend of the Five Rings. And we're going to walk through it. We're going to go through it here together. Pew. So, I mentioned here uh, before that um, in Legend of the Five Rings, there is, you, you have a character sheet uh, just like uh, anything else uh, in any other game. 
and uh, you know it's a it's a two page character sheet. Um, and I, I even kind of like the way that they break this down. We'll, we'll talk about this a little bit as we go through this and fill this out. Um, but the game also includes a, a PDF or a printable a version of what they call the game of 20 questions in which you go through a series of guess what? 20 questions, uh, answering questions along the way, filling out information about your character and their, yes, yes, their background, but with um, cool, interesting mechanical in, influence on the on your brand new character. Um, and uh, as you go through each of the questions, um, you sort of generate more and more uh, information about who your samurai is and, and, and what they're doing and where they're coming from. Now, um, uh, I mentioned before, that uh, last time we went through here, we we covered mostly just the rings and we covered sort of the skills and how the approaches of the rings match with each of the skills and that that's how you determine, you know, what you're going to um, uh, roll for, for any of your checks. But as we go through the character creation system, there's going to be a couple new things that are going to pop up. I'm going to take a few minutes to explain each of those just so we have a kind of a baseline understanding and, and concept. And again, if you have any questions or thoughts, go ahead and put it in the chat um, and I'll try to answer them. And we'll just go ahead and, and we'll have a nice relaxing evening. We'll, we'll maybe take an hour here or so to make this character if we don't get interrupted with any questions or anything like that. Um, but uh, we'll go from that. Um, uh, it's been a while, but I believe the 20 questions from Edge of the Empire Genesis, I believe actually it was originally from uh, John Wick's original Legend of the Five Rings game. Um, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I think they took it from another game themselves. Hey, London, how's it going? Uh, by the way, I would be remiss. Uh, you'll note I did not uh, f feel free to tip or donate but uh, tonight, but uh, the people came out uh, strong on uh, last Tuesday. We had some nice big tips, as you can see here. Um, oh, I, I, I forgot to... Uh, I covered up my... Covered up Ben the Hype Boss here. There we go. Uh, ben, the hype boss. Um, there we go. Um, so Ben came in with a, a very large uh, tip last time, and uh, he's our current hype boss. So uh, technically, our tip goal is reached. But of course, if you uh, want to show any appreciation, uh, everything is welcome, and uh, we really appreciate that. And uh, what I what I would really love for see you do is. If you're interested in this game, if you're interested in talking about this game, or if you're interested in learning about more role-playing games beyond Dungeons & Dragons and Pathfinder 2, um, come in and check out our Discord, uh, which is part of our Patreon, patreon.com slash nice the last call. Okay, so uh, the the game of uh, 20 questions, or uh, the 20 questions. Um, so here is our core rulebook. Gorgeous, just, just stunning artwork, by the way. I just cannot get over how good... This art is in this game. Um, it's just, uh, it's incredible. So um, <laughs> everything that we do is probably going to have to take like, a, we'll have to take a quick break and we'll have to sort of uh, 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 make a quick uh, side point about that. But um, so to begin with, we start with question number one. Which is, and, and this is great, by the way. This worksheet's great. You can see it has, um, you know, a page reference. So, you know, you've got your worksheet in front of you, and uh, we go from there. Oh, hey, look at that. Five months. Mm. Uh, that's a great question. Um, no, that's a great point. Uh, Mr. Pawn no longer himself. Uh, um. He said, I like how the Ronin book added more than, appro than more appropriate 20 questions. Yeah, so they also made a book about being a Ronin, and they kind of changed up the questions as well. So um, way to use your, your, your membership uh, re-up. Uh, but thank you for five months there, Mr. Damian Williams, pun no longer himself. Um, speaking of which, I got to talk to you there, Pawn. Um, I think I saw you volunteer maybe uh to be our fourth for uh leshy leshy land um so i might have to reach out there and talk to you about it um OK, 
Okay. Uh, so if I forget, just remind me. That's that. This is me saying I'm, I'm trying to be project manager here. <laughs> I'm, I'm reminding you to remind me because I'll probably forget. I'm, <laughs> but I will follow up with you on that. Um, okay. So really great worksheet here. It says, you know, what clan does your character belong to? And then it says page 41. So, it, you know, it says it tells you, okay, hey, go to your book, open up page 41, and we can start, uh, you know, going down here. So the first thing is clan. Now, remember, last time we were here, uh, I talked about the how in the beginning, there was the eight kami that fell from heaven. One became the emperor. And then his seven brothers and sisters, uh, you know, swore fealty to him because he won the champion. They, Of course, they had a tournament, uh, a sword fighting tournament to determine who would be the emperor and own everything. And so these other seven demigods, basically, uh, agreed to serve the uh, new emperor. And each of these demigods went and founded their own clan, uh, which, you know, became known uh, as for, uh, you know, kind of took a symbol of an animal or an idea uh, to sort of Re reflect the clan and reflect what they were doing because the emperor sort of gave each of his siblings sort of a job and a mission uh but in, in in their own way the empire works a lot like a very early version of the united states you know today we have a fairly powerful federal government and we just think of it as the united states but you know when the original 13 colonies were founded um you know it was really like 13 independent states with their own you know uh laws, their own uh, traditions, their own cultures. Um, and, uh, you know, it wasn't even that uncommon, I mean, up until the Civil War. Uh, but, you know, where some of these states would even have skirmishes and potentially sometimes even all out war. So even though they were all part of the same country and the same thing's kind of true for Rokugan. So you, you, uh, you start by picking a clan and there are seven clans uh seven great clans that are founded from those original kami but as i said before there are also all of these minor clans which represent small tiny uh you know little uh territories that you can pick from but for purposes today we're going to sort of uh talk about the seven great clans and when you go ahead and you pick your clan so we'll go back to our 20 questions here oh by the way i should start and i should note here uh, from our beginning of our of our twenty sessions, our twenty questions it says starting values. When you begin to begin, when you begin to answer the game of twenty questions, keep in mind the following baseline values for your characters. Rings. We start with a one in each of our rings. So by default, each of our ring values starts at one. That means whenever we attempt any of these actions, we're going to be rolling one black ring die. Not that great. Uh, secondly, um, all of our uh, skills start at zero. Dan to hey, thanks, Dan. It's been a long day of mourning the queen. I look forward to catching up on this video later after my 12 hours of required nightly sleep. Thanks for more L5R content, Derek. <laughs> oh, thanks, Dan. Um, I completely forgot that you are in the UK and you just got there and the queen just died. Oh my gosh. I can't decide if that's horrible timing or it's going to be like incredible to be there to see that sort of national outpouring of commemoration and respect and, uh, you know, and I'm probably legitimate sadness, um, on the half of, of, of her, her subjects. Uh, on the other hand, a lot of things are probably going to be closed over the next couple of days as well. So, uh, that's kind of crazy. Uh, you'll have to, you'll have to give us updates when you can, Dan. Thanks very much for the tip. Um, enjoy your uh, trip. Um, okay, so we start with a, a one in all of our rings. Um, Shadram on their way to the UK as well. Yeah. Um, uh, for anybody watching later, it is uh, September 8th and uh, the queen died today. Um, and 96 years old, uh, 70, 70, 71 years of, of a monarchy or something absolutely crazy like that. Um, and uh, it's just crazy. I mean, my whole life, there's always just been a Queen Elizabeth. That's it, you know? It's even weird to just think, you know, say, to say King Charles III. I mean, think about it this way. Every Bond movie, every Bond novel that has ever been written, it was always, you know, on Her Majesty's Secret Service, right? 
Her Majesty, Her Majesty, the Queen, the Queen. Because every single Bond thing every uh, was written during the, the, the reign of Queen Elizabeth. The idea that we even have, uh, you know, kings. It's like crazy. Um, uh, strange. And I'm, and I'm American, so, you know, it's just very, very strange. Ho oh. ho! Thank you, John. Thank you, John. You just became a sponsor by joining the adventure and becoming an adventurer. Welcome to the adventure, John. Enjoy your custom emojis. And uh, I believe, John, by joining, actually, I think you just unlocked another two or three emojis that we can now add some custom ones. We'll have to we'll have to figure that out with the other uh, with the other adventurers. And of course, your loyalty badge showing your uh, your awesome support for us. So appreciate it. 1952 to 19 or 2022. So 70 years. Yeah. Uh, platinum platinum wow and that's just her being the queen yeah uh, uh someone was pointing out how like her first prime minister was winston churchill like it's so crazy anthony that's a good idea dia some l5r emojis um <laughs> a fate die okay john bet you got it you got it um so, yeah, or just saying, like, God save the king instead of God save the queen. It's just even like I said, like just Prince Prince Charles. I, it, that's his name. Prince Charles, not King Charles. It's so crazy. Stephen, we'll definitely get some root ones. Um, we'll have to get like get some like some badger, fox, rabbit, eagle emojis or something. That'll be fun. Um, we'll just we can get rid of some of the burning mammoth ones. Just kidding. Um, we joked about that. We should have a, a one of the mammoths. We have the mammoth, and then we have the mammoth on fire, and then we should have another mammoth, which is dead, but it's but it's bleeding cash. It's dead, but it, instead of blood, it's just cash that's bleeding out from it. Anyways, um, Derek, what am I drinking tonight? Uh, just a soda, Henry. Sorry. I should be drinking a beer. Maybe I'll go take a break and just go get a beer. That'd be nice. No, we're going to make a character. All right. So we have what clan does our character belong to? And we have seven choices. Again, you actually have more, but for the base game, you have seven choices. We have the crab clan. And here, this this will tell you, these next page or two, tell you about the crab clan. Um, each clan that you choose will increase one of your rings. It will increase one of your skills. And... Um, It'll also set your character's initial status, which we'll talk about here in a second. Additionally, something that I really like about Legend of the Five Rings uh, is it each clan has this really cool sidebar. And it says, what does your character know? So let's just think about the Crab Clan really quick. Um, imagine the fantasy version of the Night's Watch. Uh, sort of combine how stark and the Night's Watch into like one organization. This is the clan, and, oh, and flip it. Instead of in the cold frozen north, it's actually on the south closer towards like the equator. Um, instead of undead, it's demons. They have a big wall that the crab maintain and sort of a thankless, horrible job that they are committed to 100%. Their job is to defend the Caillou Wall, as it is called, or the Carpenter Wall, as it is sometimes also called, um, and which stands between, and again, it's really, it's just like a combination of uh, the wall from Game of Thrones, you know, with a, a dash of obviously the Great Wall of China thrown in there, um, but it's on the southern border. They stand firm and protect the empire from demonic invasions from the Shadowlands, which lays to the south of the empire, which is basically, you know, hell on earth, uh, where the, the, the gates to Jikoku, which is hell, uh, are open and demons can come forth and, and spawn. Okay, that's, that's, the, that's the baseline crab. So as a crab clan samurai, all crab clan characters have general awareness of the following topics. You have a general awareness of politics within the crab lands. You can name major family heads uh, and other leaders, and you know their respective positions and allegiances. You know about the crab clan. You can identify common Shadowlands creatures such as goblins, ogres, and zombies, and you know how to def uh, defeat them. So you know about 
these Shadowlands creatures. You grew up hearing stories and songs of heroes who face greater evil still, such as Oni, but you have likely not encountered such horrors personally. So you've, you know, been around stories of these things the whole life, but maybe you don't necessarily have a, a lot of firsthand experience with them. And lastly, you know all too well the befouling taint of the Shadowlands and how best to avoid it, and you can recognize the advanced stages of this unnatural corruption. So just by being a Crab Clan, this is not a check, there's no recall knowledge, your character just knows um, a lot about all these Shadowlands, demon possession, corruption, taint mechanics uh, because you're a Crab Clan member. Okay. Um, so each of the clans gets one of these. Uh, and so we have uh, the Crab Clan and then we have the Crane Clan. Now the Crane Clan are sort of the uh, polite, courteous, but also sort of double talking politicians and artisans and uh, sort of musicians and poets. They are all about culture, all about uh, perfection in everything that they do. So that is the Crane clan. And again, you could see here, um, you know, and as reflects that, if we read how the Crane clan is different, uh, the Crane clan samurai have a strong awareness of politics within the Crane lands. But they also know about the general state of political affairs between all the clans. See, a crab clan samurai, when they start off the game, you know, they're, they've been busy at the wall. They know they could, they could tell you about the difference between a zombie and a goblin and an ogre and an oni. But, you know, they may not necessarily know what is the current political tension between the lion clan and the crane clan because they're in the crab and they don't care about that stuff. The crane clan make it their business to know all this. And so just by being a crane clan samurai, you immediately know about all the political happenings that's going on within the empire, you know, at a general high level. You know the proper etiquette and protocol when within the per imperial capital. You just, you just flat out know this right off the bat. And you have a working knowledge of the high arts and the great masters of old at least among the crane, for who else truly warrants note, right? So you can see there a little bit, a bit of the smugness. Um, so that's our crane clan. Jason, welcome. Jason B. Tip $10. What does your character know? Nothing. They have to recall everything every time, and if they fail that check, they recall the wrong thing. Ha 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 ha. 5% chance to forget your own name. Can't beat that for role-playing. RPG. 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 Um, that is true. Um, recall knowledge needs help. Um, so we also have the dragon clan. Now the dragon clan, uh, they are strange, weird, monastic people who live in the high mountains, who do not concern themselves with the comings and goings of the, of the, uh, uh, the rest of the empire they know more about um sort of survival in the wilderness they do not spend as much time you know in fancy courts or political arenas um in a sense they may not even spend as much time focused on sort of the real world in general right they are more interested in uh, meditation and achieving understanding and learning um more and more and more about the world around them uh, they are, <laughs> and then Damien said they are also really good at dual wielding. Um, the Lion Clan was charged uh, in the beginning of the formation of the Empire with always being ready to go to war. And so the Lion Clan are the military historians and military practitioners, uh, bar none, across the Empire. And so a lion clan samurai is a master of war and warfare and believes in the value of war. A lion clan samurai would tell you that Bushido literally means the way of the warrior and that all samurai, because all samurai are expected to uh, follow Bushido, in a sense, all samurai are warriors. Um. Uh, with my limited knowledge, I would have assumed meditating monks would be void, or is that not something you can get from a clan? Um, I don't think there are any clans that get stuff from void. 
uh, KC. Void is sort of the is sort of the hard one to get, <laughs> is what I would say. Uh, but Phoenix get it because Phoenix are the people who are actually the um, spiritual uh, religious clan. They're actually the ones who spend most of their time focused on uh, the Tao of Shinsei and you know studying the fortunes and the spirit realm. Um, and so they're the ones who get void. But uh, yeah, the uh, dragon clan get fire. Uh, not be, because, um, oh, what happened here? Uh, the dragon clan get fire because the dragon clan are interested in, um, creating and exploring and gaining insight into the world around them. They, they want to, um, solve problems and create solutions. You know, you could argue that in a lot of people in the empire are very, conservative and i mean that like in a political sense i don't necessarily mean like republican but i mean conservative and it's in like why do we do things this way because that's the way we've always done them you know why create a new way of making katana why create a new form of poetry we should use what our ancestors used and we should use what their ancestors used and going all the way back to the kami because the kami were gods so why would we change anything and remember that the fire ring represents passion, but it also represents creativity and creation and inspiration. Uh, and the dragon clan are sort of all about finding your own way. They're kind of socialist, kind of democratic, right? In a sort of way of they're very individualistic. Um, and they believe in the value of the self, of exploration, of self-discovery, of self-actualization. And so that's why they get fire. Um, they very much stand out, uh, you know, only probably I would say the unicorn clan come close to sort of the level of modernism that the dragon clan have. So, um, that's why the dragon gets, that's why the dragon get uh, fire. The Phoenix, however, get void because the Phoenix, um, again, the Phoenix clan is charged with the spiritual well-being of the empire. It is their job to, um, as a clan, to speak with the kami uh, that inhabit this land, all of the spirits of the of the um, of the earth, but also the spirits of heaven, and to keep everything in balance. Um, and so they are the the school that has the most practitioners, who are shugenja, who are samurai, who can. Uh, invoke and importune the kami to um you know uh, achieve results and 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 do things for them they also are very very much the keepers and practitioners and studies of the tao of shinsei which is this sort of um kind of zen buddhist philosophy that was imparted to the empire when it was very young about how seeking enlightenment and the cycle of rebirth and reincarnation um, in and fulfilling your dharma and, uh, you know, avoiding building up karma and, and seeking higher, higher in levels of enlightenment. So this is all what the Phoenix clan sort of consume themselves with as well. Um, so very much a spiritual people um, and uh, a spiritual group of samurai. Then we have the scorpion clan and the scorpion clan Basically, when the empire was founded, the emperor went to his brother Beushi and he said, hey, listen, we're all going to be these great, honorable, noble samurai. But uh, my my guess is that that's not going to work out really well if we're actually trying to run uh, a functioning government here. Um, I need you to do all the things that nobody else wants to do. I need you to be the group that are willing to get your hands dirty to do what no one else is willing to do. Um, you know, if you've watched Star Trek, the next generation, right? Scorpion clan is like section 31, you know, the Federation is this wonderful utopian ideal and everybody is, there's no war and there's no hunger and there's no poverty and there's no money. And, you know, everybody is just getting along and we just, but then there's this like section 31, which is sort of this like secret dark ops group that you know, they get their hands dirty um, and they do do the, the, the things that can dishonor you. Um, and one of the things that I love about 
the Scorpion Clan. Again, child Derek, teenage Derek, didn't like the Scorpion Clan because I was like, oh, they're bad guys. What I love about the Scorpion Clan in Legend of the Five Rings is honor, Bushido, the code, is not subjective, okay? It's an object, objective. And the Scorpion Clan, don't no one, you don't, no one tries to justify their actions, right? The Scorpion understand that they are being dishonorable. They don't try to like be like, oh, but I'm doing it for the better good. No, no, no. That's what makes the Scorpion Clan so cool. The Scorpion Clan understand that what they are doing dishonors them. It dishonors them here. It dishonors them in the next life. Okay? But they're still willing to do what needs to be done. Um, and... Uh, London, I didn't go there, but the operative from, from Serenity is also exactly right. Um, and a, to a Scorpion, like, like by saying that honor is objective, what I mean is like the Scorpion clan you, is not a situation where they go, well, but, but I did what had to be done. And so my honor is actually really, really high. No, like a Scorpion clan samurai understands that their honor may very well be nothing or zero, that they will have dishonored themselves and they will do what needs to be done. They get, they understand that they can't enjoy the fruits of their labor. That's the, that's the burden that they take onto themselves. And there's like a nobleness to that level of sacrifice, right? Um, that I think is really, really cool. Um, it, exactly, exactly. Um, you know, there is no honor for us, but what needs to be done will be done. Exactly, Ty, exactly. Um, and so, and again, this is a world where the laws of heaven and earth and the code of Bushido and the, these are all very real things. And a, and a samurai who acquits themselves with great honor and, you know, great prestige when they die has a chance of being ascended into a blessed realm or, or at least being reincarnated into a higher form or or you know you know potentially even making their way all the way up to heaven and and to the to land of yomi which is sort of like what we would call heaven uh but the scorpions say it's not that's not for us sorry you know that's just that's a bad beat you know we we do what we have to do um and you know we've we've talked a little bit about this but uh there are seven tenets to bushido um in the game and there are things like compassion, courage, courtesy, righteousness, sincerity, honor. And then the last one is duty or loyalty. And the scorpions, uh, uh, loyalty, duty is the only thing that matters. Um, for them, the only thing that, that a scorpion cannot abide is someone who betrays what they are trying to do. And ultimately the scorpion are doing everything because to be a scorpion, I know I'm going off on the scorpion clan here really deep, but to be a scorpion is basically like, you know, imagine, um, you know, we live in a world where heaven and hell are real. Like, I mean, it, it, you know, obviously for a lot of people they are, but I'm talking about physically real. Like you can look up into the sky and you can see sometimes on a clear day, you know, visions of the palaces in heaven. And if you go south into the, <laughs> near the equator, you can see the stinking festering pits that lead down into hell. Um, and you know that when you die, your spirit will go to a realm and you will be judged based on your performance and you will be either sent up or you will be sent down. Um, or you'll be sent back around again. But maybe this time you'll come back as a peasant or an animal. Or maybe you'll come back as a, you know, a very important and powerful samurai. All based off of how well you did. And the scorpions say, no, like, we are going to sacrifice all of that so that we need to do what needs to be done. All for the better, the sake of the empire, the sake of the emperor. We will do what needs to be done for the empire. We will, will we will sacrifice literally, essentially, our eternal souls. So then, when a sat, when a scorpion like betrays, like and breaks their loyalty or their duty, it's like the most insane sin for them. Because how could you? 
Like this is what after everything that we have given up to do for 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 this, and you're just gonna throw that away. Like that's that's a really horrible thing. They have a special uh, punishment um, for it, and specifically, um, in fact, here you go. Yet, in spite of and perhaps because of the clan's fearsome reputation, there is none more loyal than a scorpion. In a clan of deceivers and manipulators, trust is a hard-earned treasure to be cherished and guarded. Betrayal is punished with swift retribution. The souls of the treacherous forever bound into the horrific limbo of the place known as the Traitor's Grove. So they have a very specific punishment. Uh, what year is L5R supposed to be? Well, in the L5R verse, it's like 1123, but it doesn't really, it's in like a fantasy version of Earth. Um, because, so it doesn't really, you know, it's like, I would say it's like during the Edo period because the samurai all use, uh, weapon, you know, katanas and steel and bows. Um, and they like barely have knowledge of like gunpowder, like, but they don't really have functioning firearms per se. Um, so like, I don't know what that probably translates to roughly around, you know, like, I don't know, 13, 1400s, I would guess, maybe real life, give or take. Um, all right, uh, so that's the Scorpion Clan. And then our last clan is the Unicorn Clan. And the Unicorn Clan is interesting and unique because at the beginning of the Empire, uh, the Emperor charged the Unicorn Clan to leave the Empire and to go and learn about the rest of the world. And, and that way, like, there would be, you know, almost like scouts, and they left, and they left for hundreds and hundreds of years. And then one day they came back, and they said, hey, we're back. We want all our lands back. And everybody was like, who the hell are these people? You know, they looked funny. They had strange customs. They, they you know, they didn't look like, you know, like all the other Rokugani people. Um, you know, they had met other cultures. They had, uh, you know, uh, uh had, you know, generations of people from different races and different cultures and it all mixed together. And so the unicorn clan in a kind of xenophobic empire where they believe literally like we are the children of the sun and the moon, our founding members, uh, the founding members of our people were gods. Um, the unicorn clan are kind of like, Hey, yeah, you know, we've, you know, we borrowed some of their culture. We had sex with a bunch of those people. Uh, those people, we just straight out asked to join us. So they're very much an oddball in the grand scheme of the empire. Um, and even after, uh, you know, a, a couple hundred years, uh, uh, like 200 years, um, they are still basically seen as sort of these backwater, not truly welcome in the empire uh, type of people. Uh, but one of the advantages of leaving Rokugan, as somebody said, uh, Ty said, uh, they're, they're, they're the horse, they're the horse boys. Um, you know, the, the horses of Rokugan are basically just like stout ponies. Um, you know, they're okay for traveling, but they, they're not good for, you know, they're not thoroughbreds. They can't carry a, a man or a woman in full armor. They can't, uh, you know, carry a, a mounted combatant. They can't do heavy work. Well, the unicorn clan have real honest to God horses, uh, what we would really call cavalry. They have, you know, stallions, they have, um, uh, battle steeds, thoroughbreds. And, uh, that really gives them a huge advantage, uh, in, you know, in terms of, of warfare. So those are our basic, uh, clans. So we need to pick one. Um, and, uh, I'm, I'm open, I'm open to suggestions from the chat. Oh, one last thing while, while we get some suggestions from this. Um, I, the, one of the other things that uh, your class gives you here is status. So you can see here the Crab Clan gives you 30 status. And the Crane Clan gives you 35 status. 35 status. Um, and this is one of the three um, attributes that your character tracks on their sheet. You have honor, glory, and status. Honor is your character's 
personal belief in how well they are achieving Bushido. Now, remember, like I said, Bushido is objective, not subjective. So a samurai who lies and betrays his friends and, you know, cuts down a, a, a peasant's family but it, so that they can save the emperor's life is not going to try to justify that, right? Hey, thanks for the super chat. Um, Harj... 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 Harjutapa? Harjutapa? Been listening while working and just got home to where I can tip. Oh, thanks, buddy. I uh, just wanted to thank you for bringing more attention to L5R. I love the new system. Awesome. Um, yeah, I think we'll probably do something on the uh, the new... Harjutapa. Thank you. All right, Harjutapa. Thank you, Harjutapa. Um, but yeah, we... Uh, I'd like to talk more about the system. I'm really a fan of it. Um, I think there's a lot of cool stuff here, too, that we could use in other game systems um, as well. Uh, and I'm interested in eventually comparing this with Adventures in Rokugan, which is the sort of Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition rule set version of Rokugan, which just came out uh, a couple weeks ago and really sort of showing some of the, the pros and some of the cons. But thank you, Harutapa. Uh, appreciate that super chat. That's awesome of you. Thank you. Um, so honor is, you know, so again, your character lies. They, uh, you know, betray a loved one. Uh, you know, they're kind of a dick and they have to kill, uh, you know, some, some peasants, um, and show them no mercy, but it, but it saves the empire. It saves the lives of the emperor, uh, blah, blah, blah. And you might say, well, the ends justify the means not to a samurai. A samurai understands that by doing those things, they have dishonored themselves. No one needs to be around for you to gain or lose honor. Honor is something that you carry within yourself. And each person is their own judge. Um, and, and, and samurai are brutal judges, especially of themselves, right? So uh, honor, all the three of these can go from zero to 100, by the way. Um, glory is kind of the opposite. Glory is your character's reputation for being honorable and being an awesome samurai and being like grade A person number one. So glory is more of a reputation-based thing. So again, someone with a really, really high glory at least has renown and reputation for being a awesome samurai, good job. Honor is what you believe and what you know to be true. And lastly, status, which goes from zero to 100, represents where your character is in the feudal pecking order. 100 is the emperor at the very, very, very top of the, of the status order. Zero at the bottom is the class of Eta or um, uh, Bur Burikumen, which are basically people who are so low in status in Rokugani society, they essentially don't even count as people. It's pretty brutal. It's a, one of the things they talk about in the game is being like, maybe this is something uh, that you should think about and be, make sure everyone's comfortable with this. But, you know, caste systems uh, of people are very much a real thing in uh, Legend of the Five Rings. And this third, this lowest category and tier of people um, are very much, uh, you know, uh, part of this game. And so that, that is a status zero person. Um, uh, and then, you know, status, low status, like five or 10 might be like, a, a, you know, a, a merchant or a criminal or something. Status like 15 might be like a farmer or a person like a smith or a blacksmith, like a craftsman. Um, you get started getting into status 20. You start getting into like the lower tiers of the samurai. You get into the status 30. And now you are, you know, a proper samurai from the great clan. So going back to our 20 questions, uh, or going back to our things, the Crane Clan starts at status 35, whereas a Crab Clan Samurai starts only at 30. So yes, these are both great clans, but, you know, the Crane is part, you know, they're part of the, the hubbub of imperial activity. Um, they have more important lands and holdings. They have more political capital and more status within the Empire than a Crab Clan Samurai does. Um... Strat, yeah, and also too, Strat, well, we can talk about this, but um, those, these things um, are, uh, 
uh, have mechanics associated with them too, Strat. Uh, BH, is the Unicorn Clan under 30? That's a great question. I know that there are three that are 35, and they are sort of the wealthy, important players of the Empire. And that's the uh, Crane, the Lion, and the Scorpion. So the Crane is uh, 35, the Dragon is 30, the Lion is 35, the Phoenix is 30, the Scorpion is 35, the unicorn is 30, but honestly, I could I could honestly see them being like a, a like a 25 or like a 28. But uh, you know what it is? They have so much money. I, I think they've just they've just bought their way in. Um, so the unicorn clan is very, very wealthy because, you know, most of Rogugan hates outsiders. They don't want to trade with anybody. They don't want to like, you know, but they they well, they want things like precious silks and you know, impressive spices from faraway lands, but they like don't want to, you know, besmirch themselves and dirty themselves by conducting, you know, merchant activities with a gaijin foreigner. But the unicorn clan is like, look, we've been around the world. We know everybody. I've got connections in every port. I'll, I'll, you know what? I'll, I'll take care of it. I'll talk to these people. And then they just, you know, they collect all sorts of money. Um, So they kind of bought their way in. All right, so let's pick one. I don't see anybody really picking one. So um, let's go with... Um, how about we go with a Lion Clan Samurai? They're sort of the, uh, you know, the default de facto warrior. Rivo, thank you, buddy. Rivo Grim tipped $5. Just got home, so couldn't get this in during the clan discussion. Hypothetically speaking... Which clan would you say Oishi Yoshiho of 47 Ronin fame belong to? <laughs> um, that's a great question. Um, hmm. Well, let's see. Um, huh. I mean, they're very, very, you know, obsessed with their honor and getting revenge for people. Um, they were obviously very powerful warriors and combatants. Um, so it seems likely that they would be something like, um, they could be scorpion. Uh, they could be lion. But the idea of, of a group of, you know, uh, let's see, that's tough. Because when your lord dies, we're getting way off topic here, but, you know, again, there are sensitive topics. We, I mean, we could do a whole live stream about why, about seppuku. But in uh, Rokugani society, um, a samurai serves a lord. And a samurai without a lord is sort of like a problem. And so if a samurai's lord dies and does not have an heir and does not have a, a you know, a, a next of kin, um, they are supposed to, it, it creates like an incongruity, right? It, it, it creates a problem. How can you have a samurai without a master? Um, and so they are supposed to commit seppuku. Um, if a samurai's daimyo dies without a next of kin or an heir, uh, the retainers, the samurai who serve that lord, are supposed to commit seppuku. And if they do not, uh, they, be, they become known as ronin. Um, which literally means wave men as, you know, they are sort of riding the waves of fortune and fate, right? The ups and downs. Um, and Ronin have a kind of a, a low status in society because as samurai, um, you know, they are supposed to be serving somebody, but the, their master died. And you're like, well, yeah, but that wasn't my fault. And they're like, yeah, that's why you're supposed to just kill yourself. And that way we just resolve the whole issue. Obviously not everybody does kill themselves. And so, uh, anyways, getting back to this, uh, you know, their master in 47 Ronin um, is killed, um, you know, is, is murdered, and theoretically, like, a very honoring, practicing Bushido would, would commit seppuku, but I could also see, like, a Lion Clan samurai saying, like, uh, hold up, we will, but honor demands satisfaction, and we are going to go track this person down, kill them, and then we will commit seppuku. Uh, we'll just get around to it later. But first, we need to sort of resolve our honor before we can do that. So, yeah, maybe uh, Lion Clan. I'd probably say Lion Clan. 
Uh, Damien says that the Mantis Clan, which we did not talk about because Mantis Clan is one of the minor clans, it starts at 25 status. So there you go. Under 30 is for the minor clans. And that's maybe how they define it. So anyways, so let's go with the Lion Clan. So as a Lion Clan samurai, we have a general awareness of the politics within the Lion Lands. Uh, we can name the major family heads and other leaders, and you know their respective positions and allegiances. We know our military history quite well, especially as it pertains to the glorious deeds of our forebears. We can identify and know the proper purpose of all Rokugani battlefield weapons, even if we are not personally proficient in their use. And we know about most common military uh Maneuvers and engagements, such as feigned retreats, flank attacks, raids, sieges. So we are, you know, we are an expert at, at warfare. All right. So as a Lion Clan Samurai, we get a ring increase to water. Plus one. Oh, wait. So here we go. The Lion Clan. Oh, clean. There we go. And we also get a skill increase of plus one to tactics and our starting uh status is 35 35 there we go all right so that's our lion clan so now now that we know our lion clan uh that we are a lion clan i should say we can now go over to our next question which is what family does your character belong to so in rokugan uh, society, you have the seven great clans, which are comprised of families. If this seems like it doesn't make sense, I'll explain it to you like Game of Thrones, right? In the Game of Thrones, you have the North, okay? And it's led by House Stark. But there are other families which are sworn to House Stark, like House Karstark, House Glover, House Mormont, um, the Boltons, House Bolton. Um, so all of those houses are families which support sort of the idea of the North. So instead of the North, you would have the Crab Clan. And instead of the Lannister or the Westlands or the Reach, you would have the Crane Clan or you would have the uh, uh, Lion Clan. And then you have families within that clan that sort of each have, uh, you know, sort of a unique role. There is a family, which is sort of the head family, just like in the North, the Starks are the most important family. They're sort of the, the head honcho family and the, the head leader, the head daimyo, which is called the clan champion, who is in charge of the whole clan, uh, is usually a member of that family. And then you have the other houses. Exactly, Ty. You have the minor houses, the other families which serve them. And in many cases in Rokugan, um, these other families sort of fill different roles within the sort of uh, clan. So you might have one family which is really, really good at being warriors. And you might have another, that doesn't mean that every single samurai in that family is a warrior, but that family has a very strong warrior tradition, right? If you go back to Game of Thrones, we think of the Mormonts, you know, Jorah and uh, uh, Lady Lyanna, right? Like the, bear, the, the, you know, the Bear Island, the Mormonts, they're known for being tough and tenacious and, uh, you know, very, very, you know, begrudging and, giving their allegiance very, very rarely, but when they do it, it counts for everything, right? That's a general trait of that family, but that doesn't necessarily mean that every single person's like that. In fact, Jorah Mormont was a traitor and a slaver. So, but, you know, in his own way, he was loyal and, and brave. But uh, so yeah, the different families of the clans sort of tell you a different story uh, about who you belong to. So in our case, so again, the, the worksheet tells us who to go to. So these are the Crab Clan families. We can skip them. Here are the Crane Clan families. Here's the Dragon Clan families. And here's us, the Lion Clan families. Look at that. That's our cool looking guy with his cool looking mon, which is uh, his symbol. Um, and we've got four families that we can pick from. So we have the Okoto family, the Ikoma family, the Kitsu family, and the Matsu family. So the family that you choose will increase one of your rings. It will increase two of your skills. 
It will set your character's starting glory, which remember is like your character's uh, reputation, right? Uh, by the way, our status starting status is 35 because we chose Lion Clan. Um, oh, I didn't write. I did right there. Okay, great. Um, so our family decides our reputation, our sort of our glory score. Um, and it also decides our character's starting wealth. Now, I should note that wealth is a little bit weird for most samurai uh, because most samurai don't really need or use money. Um, as a samurai, your lord it kind of gives you what you need um, and you have servants and people who look after you. Um, dealing with money is kind of unsavory in a certain aspect. Um, it, uh, you know, it, it's like, uh, you know, well, Queen Elizabeth just died, but it's like when Queen Elizabeth goes out, it's not like she's got, you know, a hundred bucks on her, even though she is very, very wealthy, um, right? Like dealing with money or currency is actually almost considered to be dishonorable. Nonetheless, money is money. Um, and certain families are more wealthy than other families. So we have here the Okoto family. They're sort of the, the leader, the head family. In fact, every family is named after a famous ancestor who did something so important that they were given a sort of a line of, of people who will take their name going for, uh, you know, ever going forward. So in the case of the Okoto family, they are named after Okoto, who was one of the eight kami, which fell from heaven. Um, and one of them, one of the brothers and sisters who were gods and goddesses. And Okoto was the great warrior and actually the final combatants in the, the tournament of the Kami to decide who would be the emperor of this new realm. It was Okoto versus Hante. Um, those, he was the, basically it was down to those final two. Um, and Hante beat Okoto. Hante became the imperial line and Okoto founded the Okoto family. So people within the Okoto family can trace their lineage back to Okoto. But Okoto also had very uh, awesome, worthy followers, incredible retainers. And in some cases, he uh, rewarded them with their own line. And he said, I, you know, we will, there will be a line of people named after you. They will take your name and you will be they will follow your, your, you know, your, your history. They will follow your uh, uh, lineage, your legacy. They will be your legacy. So in the case of the Lion Cam family, we have four different families. We've got the Okoto family, and they're like the master war strategist. We have the Kitsu family, who are these otherworldly sort of spiritual beings who uh, can like speak with the dead and can like... Uh, uh, talk to their ancestor spirits and actually have some sort of like um, mixed bloodlines from these ancient race of Kitsu lion people that sort of let them sort of access the spirit realm. Uh, the Akoma are sort of bar basically bar warrior bards. Um, they are storytellers, historians. Um, the lion clan is all about like battles and war, but they're also about like the honor of your ancestors and remembering their names and telling their tales and, you know, being worthy of being recorded and remembered and written down. Um, and so the Akoma are kind of like the politicians of the Lion Clan, uh, but they do so under the sense of being like master historians and master storytellers. And then lastly, there is the Matsu family, which is actually a, a matriarchal family by, uh, by tradition. And they are brutal warrior you know everything is a battle um you know even a farmer is waging a war he's waging a war against the crops he's waging a war against pests so the matsu are just like this uh super militaristic super battle hardened group of uh of, of families and again historically matriarchal so uh yeah so here we go um so we got to pick some choices uh i don't know if anybody has any uh uh, thoughts or questions, uh, uh, let me know if you do, um, or if we should go with a certain route or not. I like, I'm thinking here that we will go with, um, 
think it will go. I, you know, there, there's some interesting ones here. There's, you know, if we want, and again, you can say a lot about your kit, your, your samurai. You can say a lot about your character by which family that you're going with, um, because this is the, you know, the culture and the family into which, uh, you know, sort of you were raised and born. Um, but I, I don't know. I'm feeling like being a hot-headed warrior samurai. So we are going to be from the Matsu family. So we come from uh, the Matsu. And as a member of the Matsu family, we can either increase our earth or our fire ring. So let's increase our fire ring. Feels very appropriate there. And we can add, we add one to our command and to our fitness check. So command is our ability to, you know, boss people around. And fitness is sort of this game's acrobatics, athletics, kind of all rolled into one. And as a member of the Matsu family, we start with 44 glory. And we start with five koku. So a little bit more glory than, you know, the Kitsu or the uh, Ikoma, but, uh, you know, pretty, pretty good glory because, again, we come from a family that is renowned for being great warriors and honorable battle, you know, fu you know fiery, honorable, unrelenting, uh, you know, sort of samurai in a, in a, in a nutshell. All right. So next, so that's part one. That's our core identity, our clan and our family. And just from that, Lion and Matsu. We know so much about our character, but we also have some of our, our starting stats, our status, our glory. And these numbers, not only do they mean something mechanically, but they tell you something about your character. If we were playing in a, a mixed group of samurai and I was status 35 and your samurai was status 30, we understand that there's a pecking order and that my character is higher than you. My character has more in, you know, uh, nobility than your character because I come from the lion clan and you came from, you know, the crab clan or the mantis clan. And so the further that gap, the, maybe the less I treat you as an equal, and the more I treat you as a, you know, uh, someone beneath me. Uh, so, you know, this, this tells us a lot about mechanically how to play our character, but it also tells us a lot about how to role play our character as well. All right. So next is our role and our school. This is, and we can see here, this says go to page 56. So this is this game's equivalent of choosing a class. And I hesitate to call it a class because it's so open-ended and you can really honestly pick anything you want <laughs> um, in terms of like what skills you want to learn and all that other stuff. But a school gives you a sort of it gives you literally, I think it's called a curriculum for your character to follow that if you do follow it, your character will get special, certain special advantages, but you do not, you do not have to follow these um, uh, if you don't want to. So um, uh, typically a character will go to a school that is from their clan. So it uh, doesn't necessarily have to be from your family, uh, but it does have to usually be from clan. But remember, there's nothing, there's no, there's no balance here or anything like that, that, that means that you have to be from this. Um, a, a crab clan samurai could have gone to the lion Okoto commander school. In fact, there's many examples in the, in the narrative of where they do this. Um, in, it, it, think about Game of Thrones. Theon Greyjoy is a Greyjoy from the Iron Islands. He is the son of Balon Greyjoy, who is the Lord of the Iron Islands. Uh, but because 10, 20 years, 15 years ago, when Theon was a baby, Balon Greyjoy rebelled. The uh, other kingdoms quelled the rebellion. And then to keep him in line, they took his kids and they fostered them with different people, including Theon being fostered with the Starks. So even though Theon was raised as a ironborn, uh, he grew up in a Stark household. So, you know, you might be uh, a lion clan samurai, but maybe at a young age, as part of a political trade, um, you were, tr you know, trained in an, a unicorn school or a phoenix school. That's totally awesome. You could totally make that part of your character story as long as you're making it, you know, make mechanical sense. You might want certain abilities. Um, 
So when you pick a school, uh, it is going to tell you, you get some bonuses to your rings. Uh, you get to pick some starting skills and it determines your character's starting honor. Okay. In addition, you can see here on the right, these are your character. This is your school's curriculum. Okay. When you're ki when in, in Legend of the Five Rings, you don't, um, you gain XP, ex you gain experience points, and then you spend the experience points to buy new ranks in a skill, new dice for your rings, or to pick up new techniques, which are like feats. Um, so you can spend those experience points on as you gain them. So it's not like you get nothing, 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 and then you level up. It doesn't work that way. Instead, you earn experience points every session, and then you can either, you might you might save them up to buy something really big and cool, or you could eat every session, buy a new rank in this or a new rank in this. And obviously, higher ranks cost more experience points, so it can be difficult to get to the very highest uh, levels of, of, of ability, but for the most part, you can spend your experience however you want. There are ranks to these... Um, abilities um and so you know at, when you start the game off you're a rank one samurai you cannot use rank two or rank three techniques uh feats basically um the way that you get to a new rank which is kind of like leveling up is after you've spent enough experience points you are now rank two full stop now i could spend my experience points however i want and i will eventually get to rank two and be able to use rank two techniques. But if I was an Okoto commander school uh, discipline and school, this chart is telling me that these are the things that I can spend my experience points on that count the most for getting me to rank two. So if I, as an Okoto commander school student or disciple, if I spend my experience points on martial skills, like, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat or sword fighting or bow shooting, if I spend them on government skills, command skills, performance skills, if I learn katas, you know, martial techniques, um, if, I learn, if I learn the iron forest style or the honest assessment technique, those things count for uh, essentially as double towards ranking up. In actuality, they count as 100%. Anything else counts as 50%. So what does that mean? So for example, my character, I could put my lion, I wanna, I wanna put experience points into smithing, right? My, I wanna, we're, we're, I wanna we become a great and powerful, I want to forge my own katana, you know, from the defeated blades. I want to like create my own iron throne, right? Like, but in katana form, like I want to take metal from all of the people I've defeated. And I don't know, I'm making something up here. That's smithing. I can spend my experience points on gaining ranks in smithing. And as I put experience points into smithing, I will eventually uh, rank up to rank two. Every experience point I put into smithing will count only as 50% towards leveling up. I get the full value of it for buying the rank, for buying the rank, but in terms of like tracking how much I have towards ranking up, it only counts as 50%. Because as an Okoto commander school, my schooling wants me focused on these things. So in my in the, most of the time, my experience has been it's a balance. There's nothing, it, it's not like you need to rank up. It doesn't work that way. You don't have to level up. It's not like you get hit points or anything like that, like in this game. Um, And, uh, you know, you get to, but, you know, there is some, there is a certain advantage to putting uh, your experience points in your school. That's why it's a school. That's why you chose this school. So, there, you know, it is an important choice to make. Uh, but that being said, you're not locked in. You're not, you know, you're not saying, oh, you can you can never take anything other than these six things. Nope, you could take anything you want. It's just, if you put it in somewhere else, you know, your character might gain rank two a little bit slower. And that's okay too. Uh, Ty, are we, gonna sky, are we gonna Skyrim this? Advance to rank four only through increasing crafting skills? Ty, you absolutely could. Um, and 
there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, you could easily have a Legend of the Five Rings game about a group of artisans. Um, in fact, one of the classes, one of the class types is artisan. Um, if you were so inclined. So our characters from Matsu though, and we wanted them to be like a super warrior. So there is a, uh, there is a Matsu class. Uh, again, we don't have to be from this, uh, school. We could have been from the Matsu family. Um, but then, you know, Maybe our father or mother or maybe our father and mother's Lord said, you know, hey, we are sent, you have a, an eye, you know, you have a smart mind and a, a brilliant, you know, we need more co combat commanders. We don't need just more foot soldiers. Um, we need someone who can lead and command. And, you know, at a young age, you showed an aptitude for thinking and, and thinking on your feet. We're going to send you to the Okoto Commander School. That would be awesome. You could totally do that. But, you know, because we're just kind of going with the, you know, the whole, the whole warrior aspect here, um, we will be from the Matsu Berserker School. Um, and this tells us what kind, now this thing here in parentheses, this is just a sort of reminder text. It doesn't actually really mean anything, but Bushi is a way of saying this school is about being a Bushi, a warrior. Bushi means like, you know, warrior, com combatant. Whereas, for example, if we became a kitsu medium, uh, that's a shugenja, which is sort of the elemental, sp you know, spellcaster. The ikoma, bard school, is the courtier. Those are the more politicians-focused, uh, politics-oriented characters. Again, anybody could be anything. Uh, you know, my Matsu Berserker school character could take, you know, could take points in politician, could take points in courtesy, but um, it, 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 there's nothing in the game that prevents me from doing that. Uh, but certainly I will get uh, kind of rewarded if I focus on the skills and abilities that the school wants me to do. So here we go. The Matsu Berserker School. The Matsu soldiers are the front line and main strength of the Lion Armies. Their bravery and zeal for battle are unquestioned. The Matsu Warrior Dojo teaches the primacy of offense and the necessity of seizing the initiative in all things. Aggression is the hallmark of the Matsu style. Direct action is their watchword. This bellicose attitude often puts them at odds with the careful strategies of the Okoto. But the Matsu serve the lion and the empire with unquestioned loyalty. So we are from the Matsu Berserker School. So what we are from the Matsu Berserker School. And what roles does that school fall into? And we know that that is um, Bushi. And we get um, two ring increases, earth and fire. So we get plus one earth and plus one fire. Awesome. And then we get starting skills. We get to choose five. We get plus one command, plus one fitness, plus one labor, plus one martial arts, melee, plus one martial arts, range, plus one martial arts, unarmed, and plus one survival. But we only, get to, we only can pick five of those. So keep in mind that we start with plus one command and plus one fitness. Um, so I like the idea of going an additional command uh, because, you know, now we, we'll start the game with two command. We definitely need to get some uh, martial arts uh, melee in there. I don't really see our character as being much of a, uh, uh, much of a ranged specialist, but, you know, maybe they, uh, maybe they know how to fight unarmed as well. They are like a, a true, a true grappler, a true fighter. So we got two more that we get to pick here. So we got command. We got, we could pick fitness and just making our character that much more, you know, capable of running, jumping, climbing, being, you know, awesome. Um, we could also pick up survival or we could pick up labor, which is interesting as well. Now this kind of tells us a little bit about our character as well. You know, if our character has, uh, you know, a skill like labor, which by the way, comes from the trade skill, section um, these skills are kind of considered to be low skills right samurai should not be you know samurai are meant to engage in battle uh you know they are meant to be the way of the warrior bushido bushido 
means way of the warrior. So things like, you know, earning profit and trading money and, you know, uh, working with your hands and, uh, you know, committing, you know, petty crimes, those things are kind of considered to be low. Um, you know, not exactly things that uh, are, are, you know, perfect for a samurai. But I have a sense of, uh, of our samurai being a little bit of a pragmatist. And, you know, when you are, you know, at, uh, you know, at, at a siege camp or you're getting ready to, uh, you know, create earthworks for, you know, uh, an army, um, you know, practicality wins the day. And the lion are ultimately always about winning war. Um, even if it means getting literally getting their hands dirty. So we'll put labor in there as plus one. And then just to round it up, we'll make fitness uh, plus one as well. Fitness plus one. And then as a Matsu, we are a samurai samurai. So we have 55 starting honor, which is very, very high. Um, I think, I think the game starts to give you mechanical benefits at like, 770 or 75 or something like that so we uh you know we we hold ourselves to be pretty highly you know uh, in line with bushido um we get we can choose from katas rituals and suji which we'll talk about kata, rituals and sujis these are the type of techniques that you can choose from uh there are you know, you can see here that there are seven techniques. Kata are basically uh, melee techniques, um, or I should say combat techniques. Kiho are monk techniques that involve focusing and harnessing your ki. Uh, invocations are spells. Rituals are like non-spellcaster spells. So rituals are like ceremonies or long duration uh, processes, which can give you a mechanical benefit, um, but that technically anyone can do. Suji are like kata, but for social uh, combat. Maho are special, the last two, Maho and Ninjutsu are considered very dangerous, potentially dishonorable. Maho is the infamous blood magic, often tainted by... Uh, a touch of Jikoku, which is hell, um, and known for being dark, powerful. And ninjutsu is the secretive, some people say, don't don't exist uh, domain of, you know, of the ninja. And nothing that a, any truly honorable samurai would ever be caught, uh, you know, dead doing. Um, we also get starting techniques. We get a kata, which is either we get the rushing avalanche style or... Or we get the spinning blade style. So these are basically just two uh, techniques or feats that we could start with. We could pick one. Um, I'm not going to go look them up uh, and 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 get into it. Uh, but we'll just take the we'll just take the rushing avalanche style. But you know, normally you would go, you would look up which you know what they do mechanically in the game, and uh, and we would you know go from there. We also get the stirring the embers which is a suji. So we get those two starting techniques. And by the way, when we get down into the kata, we can take a look at rushing avalanche style um, and we can take a look at it. We also get our school ability. Everybody gets this, which is called the Matsu's Fury. After we suffer a critical strike or unmask, we may suffer the enrage condition to remove an amount of fatigue from yourself equal to your school's rank. What does this mean? It means... If our character gets critically hit or if our character unmasks, which is the samurai way of letting go, letting your emotions show, dropping decorum and kind of having a real emotional moment, our character can choose to suffer the enrage condition, which ordinarily might be a negative, and we actually heal ourselves. We lose fatigue. Fatigue is sort of your version of hit points in this game. So basically, when our character gets critically hit or when they, you know, lose their temper, they can go big time and they can actually be voluntarily become enraged to essentially heal themselves. But then once you're enraged, not only do you get some bonuses, but you get some penalties as well. So our school ability is Matsu's Fury, which we can put here. And then lastly, um, we have... Uh, 
our character's starting outfit. And we start with uh, basic armor, traveling clothes, a daisho, which is a katana and a wakasashi. We start with a no dochi, which is a great sword, or a tessin, which is a war fan, a knife, a yumi, which is a bow, a quiver of arrows, and a traveling pack. Um, so we can start with uh, that as well. Um, so we'll start with a no dochi because that seems pretty sweet. Sorry, sorry, Tessin. All right, well, it's being a pain in the butt. Um, all right, so, cool. We know a lot about our characters now. So now we get to some really cool, quick questions. Again, um, the only petty crime here is the crime against fashion with the Lion Clan helmet beard. <laughs> um, so, real quick, these are just quick beats. And now here's the best thing about it. When you're playing this game, let's take a look where this is. Uh, page 88. When you're playing this game, you can describe this as much or as little as you want. Okay. I should also note that the highest ring rank that you can have in the game at the start is three. So, for example, we are right now, uh, all, because remember, everything starts at one. All of our rings start at one. So from our, uh, just from our questions, we already have a fire of three. We have an earth of two and we have a water of two. Um, so just something to keep in mind. If um, most people I know that I've seen have said that if you, if you would get above a three, you can uh, put it somewhere else. But so question number four, how does your character stand out in their school? Now, here's what I was talking about when I said you can go as deep as you want uh, or you can go as um, brief as you want. This is where, like, the game has a nice balance between people who really want to go deep and people who don't want to go deep. So, for example, how does my, you know, so we have our Matsu. They are at the Matsu Berserker School. Um, how do they stand out within their school? And you can see here, there's a, you know, they give you a nice big chunk of text here. Well, guess what? We could just say uh, thoroughness, patience, or calm. You know, we could say that they're, you know, they're notably thorough, right? Stoicism is a trait greatly valued in Rokugan. Your character bears challenges and hardships without complaint. Your character's teachers might have come to rely upon them as an assistant instructor, right? So we could just say thoroughness. But if you really want to go deep and talk about why, how your character stands out in your school, this is a great place to put it down. It's a cool place to add it. At the end of the day, what does it do? It gives us plus one earth. And that's the most important takeaway from the mechanical side of it. But you could get into the weeds with this if you wanted to, and you could really kind of expand this out or for a lot of people it might be enough to just know that your character has a reputation for being you know very thorough and patient um at, at their school and you know as seen as you know like again maybe our character could have gone to a kodo in fact maybe they wanted him to go to a kodo but our character grew up on the legends of his matsu berserker forebears and he wanted to be a a great warrior just like them he didn't want to be some commander you know who is never gets his hands bloody who can never seize glory for himself um you know by by leading armies from afar he wanted to be in the thick of it um so uh but he has this gift of of being very thorough and very patient okay so again simple you could explain it or you could just say thoroughness plus one earth all right Question five, who is your Lord and what is your character's duty to them? Select your Giri. So Giri can change throughout the game, but Giri is basically what is your Lord's current duty to your character? What is their command? What is the, what is the, sam, what is your samurai's mission? And you can see here, you can, this kind of goes into detail about it. It says, your samurai's lord is a figure of utmost importance in their life. The individual to whom you have sworn their fealty directly. While your samurai's lord might in turn have a lord of their own, 
in fact, this is the way the empire works. Your lord has a lord who has a lord who has a lord all the way up to the emperor, right? So while your samurai's lord might in turn have a lord of their own, your character's oath is to their lord directly rather than the hierarchy in which they exist. This is an important concept, not only in feudalism, but in Rokugani society as well. Um, I am not pledging my service to the emperor. I serve the emperor ostensibly through this feudal system, but my oath, my loyalty is to my daimyo. Um, who is this individual and how does your character serve them? Your lord might be a provincial daimyo, an official of some kind in the imperial bureaucracy, a great general, or somebody of humbler status, but still higher status than your own. Ask your GM if they want you to invent this figure on your own or if they intend to provide the identity of your character's lord. This is a great opportunity, by the way, for players to mix and match, especially if your characters are all from the same clan. I think it could be really cool if one or two people, um, well, obviously one, but if like more than one person have maybe the same lord. And maybe some of people have different lords within the same clan, but there could still be some conflict of interest there. Not every lord wants the same thing. Um, uh, ask your GM if they want you to invent this figure on your own or if they intend to provide the identity of your character's lord. Your character's lord is intrinsically tied to your character's giri, a motive that should play an important major part in your character's dramatic art. Uh, after you decide who your character's lord is, you should work with the GM to determine specifics. What is their name? What role do they serve in the clan? What sort of personality and history do they have? Yes, exactly. I mean, you can get into the weeds on this and really building this up. And in fact, it says here, depending on the type of campaign your GM is running, your character's lord might be a clan magistrate, a city governor, a provincial daimyo, or even a great clan family daimyo. The GM should give players a large degree of leeway in their selection of a giri as long as it is not disruptive to the story, as it should be something that the player is invested in seeing their character pursue during the campaign. This is an opportunity for you as a player to talk and work it out with your GM. Like, for example, if when we were sitting there getting together, like, we'll say this. When we were planning out this campaign, we said, guys, I want to do, like, this really cool war campaign. Um, you know, we know in the in the in the in the literature that there have been this tension between the lion and the crane, the two great, you know, clans of the empire, the right hand, the strong right hand of the empire and the wise left hand of the empire have sort of been trading and, you know, dancing back and forth with blows for a long time. Let's do a campaign that really explores this conflict and sees it, you know, blow up. So we're going to be doing kind of a war campaign and you go, okay, cool. So, you know, my character's Lord is, uh, you know, um, is Matsu, you know, Matsu Oroke, okay? They are a, um, you know, they are a, uh, a junior uh, general uh, in uh, Matsu Suke's uh, Grand Southern Army, okay? They're ambitious um, and wasteful. <laughs> okay, so this person, maybe not the best person in the world, right? They're very ambitious. Uh, they, they, they aren't very, uh, you know, uh, they're wasteful. They're not very uh, careful with their, their plans. Maybe they're even wasteful with, you know, the lives of, uh, of the samurai under their, uh, you know, job. Um, and what is, you know, so this is, this is my, my daimyo who I'm going to war with that, you know, he's uh, gotten this position and I am to serve him. Um, and maybe, you know, his giri to me is um, he wants me to claim uh, the village of Sumai in the Osari Plains. And that means take it from the Crane Clan, right? So that is what he, my lord, has charged me with. And remember, as a, as a samurai, duty and loyalty are, are one of the most important parts of Bushido. And nothing is more important to my character than my giri. Except, question number nine. Uh, I'm sorry, question number six. <laughs> question number nine, I'm getting too ahead of myself. Uh, by the way, the book has more information about selecting Giri. It talks about, you know, it, you know, in a sense, uh, you know, just like anything else in uh, like when you're doing job objectives for your, for your work, uh, you know, a Giri in a sense, uh, you know, to make it 
I think personally should be smart, right? It should be uh, specific. Uh, God, what's the M? Nate. This tells you how, how often I do this. Uh, attainable, reasonable, timely, measurable. Thank you. Right? So, you know, uh, to claim the village of Sumai in the Osari Plains, okay, before winter or before fall, actually, that that's when uh, usually when a uh, campaign stops in Rokugan. So here we go. Very specific. It's measurable. Is it attainable? Is it? Yes. Is it reasonable? Well, maybe. Is it timely? Yes. Okay, great. So now we have everything that we need to know for this Giri. So my Lord Matsuo Rokai has given me this command to, to, to claim the village of Sumai in the Osari Plains before the fall. All right, which means take it from the Crane Clan, um, because Matsu Orokai is ambitious, and Matsu Orokai thinks that if he can claim, uh, you know, uh, the the village uh, and show his superiors, you know, they will reward him with more lands and more titles and more status and stuff like that. Now, Matsu Orokai doesn't care about the lives perhaps being spent to claim this village, and perhaps even now, uh, you know, is not making a good use of the resources that are being given to them. How does, how does my character feel about that? In fact, this gets to question number six. What does your character long for and how might this impede their duty? And this is so important to creating an L5R character. And by the way, like I said, Giri and Ninjo are the, the yin and yang of around which a, a, a campaign runs. And when you're sitting down to make a campaign um, with your friends, choosing Ninjos and Giris that play off of one another is so cool and so important, right? Because, you know, if you have a character's giri, which aligns or opposes with another character's giri or ninjo, it can create this really fun tension, right? L5R is not a game that is shy about intra-party conflict or intra-party tension. It can, it can really lean into that. So what does our character long for and how might they impede them? Boom, we got a ton of stuff here about your character's ninjo. This is this is your character's personal belief and what do they want, right? Um, what, you know, what uh, what is my character? And, and, and also choose something that's going to conflict, right, with my giri because that's what makes the game interesting. Yes, you are, ma you are setting it up to be hard for yourself. So what, what does our samurai really want, right? Well, maybe Sumai is a, you know, they're, they're, I mean, a couple options come to mind, right? Maybe what they really want to do is, um, uh, you know, they want to fight uh, a duel against uh, Kakita, uh, Kakita, I'm trying to come up with a name, name here, um, Kakita Hatsu, okay, who dishonored my father and killed him five years ago. Okay? That could be an option. It, it, it's also possible that maybe my character secretly loves uh, the, 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 the crane samurai who guards the village of Sumai. Or maybe my character thinks that his general, his daimyo, is a wasteful, dishonorable man and thinks that he would be a better general than his own lord. You know, you, you want to create dramatic, you're like, but Derek, that's going to be dramatic and problematic. It's going to create a ton of problems and issues and nothing's going to be smooth and easy. Exactly. You want your characters to be, life to be messy, right? So, my daimyo is ordering me to go claim the village of Sumai in the Osari Plains before the fall, but that is not where Kakita Hatsu is. And now that we are at war, this is a perfect opportunity for my character to get into a fight and go challenge Kakita Hatsu and avenge his father's death, who, who he slain, who he killed, and did not give him, you know, um, honorable. But, you know, what is my character going to choose? Is my character, will my character disobey his order? because he hears that Kakita Hatsu is, you know, marching north. You know, what about, you know, maybe this village isn't even that important, militarily speaking. 
it's really just a vanity project for my, you know, wasteful Lord. By the way, it's, you know, it's a common trope to make the, you know, your daimyo um, you know, less than perfect. But I think part of the, the appeal of this game is to make everybody less than perfect. If everybody is just a perfect Mary Sue samurai, um, I think the game loses, a, and that includes you. I think the game loses a little bit uh, of, of stuff. So again, this is a huge part of the game. Uh, it gives you some really great, you know, it's like two pages here about choosing your character's ninjo. Um, it talks about good ideas, bad ideas, how to interlock it. Um, you know, and again, it goes into the real question. Is this something that you, you, the player, are interested in? Is this something that your table is interested in? Um, you know, BH mentioned, you know, a character's a love interest. Okay, that's a great option. Do you want to explore a potential love romance triangle? No? Well, then don't pick that, right? Pick something that is going to interest you. If me, Derek, I'm like, you know, this game has a whole subsection, a whole sub rule on dueling. I think that's awesome. And like, what a cool way for this campaign to, maybe my character gets killed fighting a duel against Kakita Hatsu. Maybe, I, maybe I win. I don't know. I'd love to duel. And this would be a cool way for me to introduce this. I'm excited to go duel this guy. I don't even know who this guy is. I just made him, but already I'm like, you killed my father, prepare to die. Right. I'm going full Inigo Montoya here. Um, so it's, it's really great. Um, seven. Another example of a really short quick question. You can answer it in one set, uh, one statement, or you could expand it further with your own interest in background. But at the end of the day, it's going to, you know, create um, one of these two uh, mechanical effects, which is seven. What is your character's relationship with your clan? Not every samurai lives and breathes their clan's creed. Sometimes individuals, you know, uh, diverge considerably for their clan. So you get a choice. If your character firmly believes in the precepts of their clan and the values it holds dear, gain plus five glory based on their reputation as an upstanding member of the community. If your character has a fundamental disagreement with their clan's beliefs, policies, or practices and has defied these in the past, gain one rank in a skill in which you have zero ranks. Consider why this skill represents a divergence from the clan's training or values. So huge opportunity there for you to build out backstory, but it matters and it's going to impact how you play your character and where you come from, right? Uh, I mean, in this particular instance, I believe my character probably uh, believed firmly in the precepts of the Lion Clan, but it says maybe you don't and you have something instead. Like for example, what if my character had a rank in medicine and it's because my character believes that, uh, you know, um, fallen samurai should be, uh, you know, shouldn't just be left for dead, right? Everyone should be cared for. Or maybe my character believes in victory, but doesn't believe in killing, right? There's a lot of different ways that you could like push your character into some, you know, interesting ideas here. And then you pick up a skill rank in, in, in exchange for that. So what is my character's relationship with their clan? Uh, you know, it's, uh, I, I believe, I believe firmly in the precepts of our clan and the values it holds dear. Right. So we're not going to take the skill increase. We're going to take the plus five glory. All right. Again, my character is a samurai samurai. Um, what does your character think of Bushido? All samurai are supposed to respect and venerate the clams of uh, code of Bushido, but some clans and families pay more attention to some tenants than others. And each clan's view on Bushido can differ. And each individual's view on Bushido can differ. Does your character agree with the clan's views or does your character differ on certain points or even disregard certain elements of Bushido? If your character's belief in Bushido is completely in alignment in their campaign, what past experiences have reinforced it or renewed their faith? These are asking real questions for you to figure out. Um, if your character believing, if your character belief in living by an orthodox interpretation of Bushido is very staunch, gain plus 10 honor. Uh, if your character diverges from beliefs, uh, of how samurai should behave, gain one rank in one of the following skills to reflect past behavior that was unbefitting of samurai or deeply defied the norm, right? And you get you get some low skills over here, including that medicine rank. Um, so yeah, like, you know, um, you know, we'll say that our character is very much a believer uh, in staunch Bushido, but, you know, if, if we were, I really had the time to go into this, um, I think we would talk about how, um, you know, our character has grown up. I mean, we're kind of going down an Inigo Montoya route here, but, uh, you know, the Lion Clan hold honor to be, you know, to be sacrosanct, to be the highest um, of the of the plans. And I think this, you know, this idea of uh, 
regaining his family's honor by by killing this Kakita, you know, has sort of consumed him. And and he thinks about every day about how this clan, crane clan wronged his family. Um, and, you know, this whole, you know, nine yards. And it's like, it's really made him sort of dive deep into uh, believing in the tenets that, you know, honor demands satisfaction. And, it, and, and only a proper Bushido, only a proper samurai following Bushido should do this. Uh, question nine. So now part four, strength and weaknesses. Uh, beyond their rings and skills, characters are also defined by their advantages and disadvantages, the quirks and vulnerabilities that make them tick. This isn't just background nonsense. This is mechanical stuff. Nine. What is your character's greatest achievement so far? Bunch of sections here about this stuff. Um, you, you know, you choose what your character is sort of known for. And when you do this, you pick up what is called a distinction. We talked about these in the last episode, but a distinction is kind of like a uh, feat. And it basically specifies something that your character gains an advantage for. And when you have a distinction, if that advantage would apply, after you make a dice roll check and you've gotten your dice pool and you roll your dice, you can choose up to two dice and re-roll them. So if you rolled two dice that were crap and you, or you're looking for a better roll, you can pick up two dice and re-roll them if your character's distinction uh, applies. And they give you a bunch of examples in the book, but it even says very specifically, these are literally just examples. You could, in theory, make anything, uh, make anything up as long as you can sort of make it make sense. Um, so, you know, maybe your character is ambidextrous. Maybe your character um, has a blessed lineage, uh, is betrothed to someone in very, very, very happy about that. They're um, very honest or very reliable. They're flexible. Uh, you know, there's like a million different options. They have great balance. Any of these things. Keen sight. Um, you know, we'll we'll just pick this one just because we'll, why not? So we'll say that our character has keen sight. Um you know, so we'll say that, um, you know, what are their greatest accomplishments so far? They, um, you know, they famously um, spied a uh, an ambush of, you know, uh, scorpion ninja uh, from a far distance and saved uh, the lives of several high ranking uh, you know, daimyo, right? So my character just has this really good vision and has really keen sight. Um, and, you know, this is kind of the, the story of, you know, how and when it came up, but my character has this keen sight water. And again, you can go through all of these and just come up with a little story about why your character has this ability or why your character has this sort of advantage. Um, sometimes it might be a story about about that advantage or it could be a story about how you actually acquired it see because sometimes it's like an actual trait of like quick reflexes or things like that but other times it's something more like you gained you know i gained the support of a group um like i made friends with uh you know some spirits or i made friends with some dragon clan samurai or something like that uh question number n uh, 10 what holds your character back most in life. So question 10 is asking about, not about uh, advantages, about disadvantages, right? What is my character not good at? What is my character uh, problematic with? Um, so let's say, uh, hmm. Ooh, we have a sworn enemy, huh? I think we do. Uh I mean, we've, we, we've kind of already established this, right? That my character has a swarm enemy. Um, obsessed with dueling and killing Kakita. Uh, I already forgot their character's name. Hatsu. So... I have this sworn enemy disadvantage. Um, it says, you and the GM should select or create a character to be your sworn enemy. Your sworn enemy exists within the world and periodically meddles in your affairs, directly or indirectly, at the GM's discretion. If your sworn enemy perishes, you must either remove this disadvantage, acquire a new sworn enemy, or find a way for your deceased foe to continue playing a role in your life. When you make a check to remain rational in the presence of this person you hate, okay, um, you have to, after you make the check... 
you can your GM can re-roll two of the dice uh, in a bad way. So it's like you know maybe you know uh, imagine a situation where you know they're coming under a white banner to to treat or to you know whatever. Um, uh, and my character has to literally make a check because that's what part of this game is. Part of this game is the mechanics tell you how you're, you're going to play, um, right? It's not just a, I have complete autonomy over my character. They do as my will. I am their puppet. No, like if, you know, this guy comes in uh, to, you know, under a banner of truce, uh, maybe, maybe hundreds of lives, thousands of lives could be saved this day because we could just agree to a, a ceasefire or a withdraw or an exchange of plans. But my character literally has to make a check, right? To avoid calling this person out, calling them a coward in front of everybody, right? Just because this is my sworn enemy, I will not let him get away with it. Um, and you know, this also implies that this character is knows who I am and they take an effort to meddle with me. Um, you know, maybe um, they've sworn, maybe we don't know about this, but maybe maybe they've sworn to, to kill everyone in our, my bloodline. So maybe he considers me his enemy as well. Um, oh, Ty, I love it. Yeah, when you if you kill Hatsu, his son declares you as an enemy, right? Like, this whole thing could just spiral out of control um, depending on how one you want to go. So this is our character's sworn enemy. Okay, question number 11. What activity makes your characters feel most at peace? Now we get to choose a passion, all right? Um, again, the game, the, the game lists some examples of it, but I'm going to say um, making and drinking tea. Um, <laughs> tea. Uh, what do I say that is? Uh, I'll say it's water. Uh, you know, my character loves the order and the peace of, of preparing the tea and sitting with his companions or his friends or his family and just, you know, having a moment to sort of contemplate and quietly sit down with tea. Um, it's what kind of gets him through the day the way that, in, you know, some people might turn to some shugo or some sake. My character uh, turns to tea. And what does this mean in the game? It means that if my character has an opportunity to relax and, you know, have some tea and go through the process and the ceremony, they can lower some of their character's stress, which in this game is called strife. Um, because it relaxes me. On the other hand, my character might have an adversity. This is something that per opposite causes my character strife, causes my character. What concern, fear, or foible troubles our character the most? Um, for this one, let's take a look here. What do we got here? Um, let's see. Uh, we could be afraid of water. We could be superstitious. We could be perfectionist, painfully honest. Um, I don't think our character's meek, materialistic. Oh, they could be a flirt. That's kind of fun. Uh, we already said that their character is... Now, remember, part of the thing, part of the fun thing, one of, one of the things that Aaron and I discovered when we played this game, you'll notice that a lot of these traits, uh, all these things have a, a ring associated with them. And so the idea is that, 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 that this uh, phobia is likely, or this anxiety is likely to come up in checks revolving around that. So for example, water checks are usually about, well, you know, being tolerant and coming to understanding and being flexible and willing to compromise. Um, your character might be all of those things, but on that one particular point, they are intolerant, right? And um, one of the mistakes that we made when we first made Legend of the Five Rings character is we would say, oh, okay, well, my character has, uh, you know, a really low water ring. So they're kind of not very tolerant and they're not very charming and they're not very, you know, all those things. So I'm also going to give them the flaw of intolerant. It's a bad idea. The flaw should be, in my opinion, something that you're otherwise good at. And the reason for this is because when it's something that you're good at, those are the things that you're going to be making checks for a lot which means that there's going to be an opportunity for this to come up a lot and earn you void points, which is kind of why it's like the mechanical reason, right? Those are like the game's hero points. So for example, we know that our character has, uh, what do we have? We had plus one earth, plus one earth. So we're at three fire and three earth, 
okay? So our character has a really high fire and a really high earth. So what if um, our character is... Uh... Oh, I'm addicted. That's brutal. Um... Yes, Strat. It is doing the burning wheel thing of wanting to screw your characters over for meta resources. Not meta resources in the fate point sense, but more like hero points or, an, or, or inspiration. It's also just about making your character interesting, right? And, um, you know, being, uh, you know, uh, you know, actually, let's go with this. I like the idea of this, right? Our character, you know, they, they are, uh, we said before that they were. Um, we said before that they stood out because they're very thorough, right? Their character's almost OCD, right? Their character is very like he crosses all the T's, he dots all the I's, right? He has a very high earth ring. He's very logical. He's very ordered. He's very whatever. But so he's got a really high earth rank, but he's impatient. Okay, so we're gonna say that our character, despite having a really high earth ring is actually really impatient. Um, he does not like to sit around. He likes to act, right? Um, so, uh, you know, what concern, fear, or foible troubles you most? And again, we could write a whole story here about, you know, about how our character, why is our character impatient? Uh, you know, why is our, you know, maybe they were just a young person samurai when their father died and their whole life they've just been waiting you know to be you know to become a samurai to achieve their genpuku to get their blade so that they could go and they get their wrench and everything else in his life just seems like it's a waste of time and he just hates everybody else wasting his time it just drives him crazy um and so his, this character is very impatient um and so even though we have a really high earth ring when we go and try to make a check to sort of force us to wait um it can cause us problems. In fact, it'll give us stress. So like, you know, like if, if our character's like, wish, you know, well, uh, it's time for us to attack. And it's like, well, we're still waiting for everybody to arrive before we get, and you're like, come on. And your character can gain strife from that and also gain a void point, which is the meta currency that you could use to be awesome. But it's a fun way to sort of play that back and forth from your character, which I think is really interesting. All right, question number 13. Who has your character learned the most from during their life? Page 93. Um, nearly every human owes some portion of their personality strength and weaknesses to the people around them. And usually a few people in particular stand out as mentors. Who is our characters and mentor? All right. In the relationship section on your character sheet, record the name of this person. Okay. So again, this is a great opportunity for us to, to, to write all this stuff down and we can either gain a skill increase and a disadvantage, or we could just gain an advantage. So we're going to make something up. We're going to make up, um, let's say, uh, uh, let's say it's a, it's a Ronin. Okay. Uh, who, who goes by the name, um, you know, um, who got, uh, what's a good name? Hawari, okay? And Hawari is this, uh, she's this badass duelist, okay? And, you know, again, if we were making this character, like, for real, like, we would describe how my character met Hawari and who Hawari is. But my character, now, Lion especially, you know, Ronin are sort of outside of the normal order of structure, and normally they wouldn't do this. But my character wanted to learn how to duel. And so he sort of, you know, fell in with this Hawari character and, you know, took, took himself under her, you know, wing and because he wanted to learn how to be a good duelist. Okay. And so we gain in this case is uh, an advantage. So we'll say that, uh, you know, he gained, and I'm just picking these up because we're just going through this quickly, but let's say that he gained the quick reflexes. Um, uh, because Hawari, you know, maybe Hawari actually was a disgraced crane. And crane duelists are some of the most legendary in the land. They practice ei jutsu, right? The act of striking and drawing at the same time in one perfect killing stroke. And Hawari was always, you know, harping about how it is not the stronger blade, but the quicker blade that can that wins in a duel. And that if I wish, if I wanted to beat 
Kakita Hoari, who is a, or not Kakita Hoari, sorry, uh, Kakita Hatsu, who is a legendary crane duelist, okay? I couldn't just be this brutish lion hacking my way through the duel. I had to learn to be speed. I had to learn to be as fast. And there could be a whole huge thing here with Hawari and where, what her background is. And then, you know, you throw the whole thing into it. Maybe Hawari is actually related to Kakita Hatsu. Uh, who knows, right? It's perfect samurai drama. You just, you go with the flow and you see what the dice come up. And by the way, this is where those opportunity symbols could come up. Right. So like, for example, like in the middle of a campaign, you might roll some dice and it's a check against Hawari and you roll three opportunity and you're like, wait a second, I'm going to spend those three opportunity. What if Hawari, OK, was hot, you know, <laughs> Hawari is the ex-wife of Hatsu. Yeah. Who knows? Right. Like maybe. It could be it could be a million different things, um, and, and 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 as a player and as the GM, the dice rolls and the opportunity symbols allow you to add that sort of of narrative inclusion to the game. Obviously, the game master can also take the game in certain directions, but I'm a big fan of letting the dice decide as well. Um, what do people first notice? Uh, what do people notice first upon encountering your character? Uh, page ninety three. So this is something special and unique. Um, personality behavior. Um, in a given region, um, you know, uh, samurai are expected to behave, dress, and comport themselves in certain ways. Uh, within their homeland, however, in any aspect of a character that veers from the norm, from slightly odd, from slight oddities of appearance to trivial mannerisms, tend to attract attention. A character might stand out for their unusual looks, strange dress, or ancestry that can be traced to far-flung parts of the Emerald Empire. A minor behavior like chewing one's lip when nervous or clasping one hands to hide trembling fingers could be the thing that other characters remember about a character. Perhaps the character always says the same thing when meeting a stranger. All these things, you know, uh, you know, it's like you wouldn't happen to have six hands or six fingers on your right hand, would you? Um, all these things add subtle depth to your character, and so does a deliberate absence of memorable details. Record the answer in your personality, habits, and quirks section of your character sheet. Additionally, choose one distinctive aesthetic accoutrement that your character carries or wears most of the time, e.g. a scarf, a hair ornament, an engraved scabbard, an eye patch. This personal bit of flair might act as striking features or stand in contrast to them. I mean, again, it's getting late here, so we're not going to go super into this, but, you know, this is a great opportunity to sort of, you know, describe what is, what is, the, what is the key takeaway from your character, right? Um, uh, uh, you know, a, a striking uh, young Matsu warrior with... Uh, piercing eye, piercing gray eyes um which are always shifting from left to right right he's got those keen eyes he's impatient right my character always seems to be ready um and you know maybe his personal accoutrement is uh an exceptionally uh old and worn uh katana scabbard and this has been passed down for many generations and many generations within his family. It was his father's katana scabbard. Um, and he, while he wields his katana in it currently, maybe, uh, you know, uh, Kakita uh, Hatsu, when he killed my father, um, he did not return the katana. And so I, I intend to, uh, to reclaim that katana and sheath it back in the scabbard and return it to our family's Kamidana ancestry shine, right? So we have this exceptionally worn uh, old and worn katana scabbard. Okay, that was my father's. All right, question 15. How does your character react to stressful situations? Now, this is um, this goes back to what I was talking to about unmasking. Um, in this game, now, you can, uh, you know, uh, you can uh, vary from this. You're not locked into this. But in this game, when your character acquires enough stress their character will become compromised. And once a samurai is compromised, mechanically, they are no longer able to function as well. One of the options that a samurai can have is to unmask and to let out a burst of emotion in a very inappropriate samurai way that causes a lot of problems. This is, what is your character's sort of go-to way of unmasking? How does your character unmask, right? Maybe they say exactly what's on their mind, even if it will cause immense social problems maybe they storm off in a rage maybe they scream or yell or in the case of our hot-headed young fool maybe he challenges people to duels okay 
So when he gets angry, if he feels like his, you know, he's stressed out, he's angry, his honor's been besmirched, he says, screw it, I challenge you to a duel, which could create a lot of problems. But, you know, he's also got a little cockiness in him because he's been trained by Hawari, the badass Ronin duelist. So maybe that'll that'll be an interesting way of doing it. 16, what are your characters' pre-existing relationships with other clans, families, organizations, and traditions? Again, big questions with a lot of opportunity here to write. Again, Another great way of introducing new NPC characters. Another reason why I stress that I think Legend of the Five Rings works better as a clan-based game rather than a sort of multi-clan, Emerald Magistrate, Scooby-Doo type game. I think by keeping everybody within the same clan, you create interesting opportunities for uh, these NPCs to be used and recur over and over and over again. So... Um, I mean, there's so much here that we could go into, so I'm just going to kind of probably skip this question. But additionally, when you do this, um, you get to, you get basically, you start the game with kind of like a quasi magical item. You choose one item of rarity seven level, rarity seven or lower that your character received as a gift from one such group took in battle fighting against them or that otherwise relates to or symbolizes the character's past and ongoing relationship with them. Add this item to your character's starting outfit. Um, you know, so maybe, um, hmm, let's see, you know, is your character betrothed or married to a member of another family or clan? Um, yeah, so Matsu is a matriarchal society. Women Matsu, women of the Matsu clan, never marry out of their clan. But um, male Matsu can. And so we will say that my character is betrothed to wed a, let's see. Let's say that I am betrothed to marry a Phoenix Shugenja uh, as part of an attempt to build an alliance with the Phoenix to keep them neutral in the upcoming battles against the crane. Uh, not a big fan. Uh, as a gift, and again, uh, so, you know, well, this this will be uh, Isawa. Um, uh, Nakode. And as a gift from the matchmaking, matchmakers slash the Isawa, um, they gave me, I don't know, some cool magic item. <laughs> I like the saying, I fought on the wall with the crabs and got a finger of jade. Yes, a finger of jade. Thank you for that uh, super chat, Damian Williams. Um, again, you know, a, a, a crab campaign could be very different than another campaign. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, Damien is using his uh, knowledge of Legend of the Five Rings to make a funny joke, but uh, uh, sometimes that's all you get when you fight on the wall with crabs. Um, so yeah, and so you know, at this point, we could go in and we could you know find a uh, an item that we want, and uh, we could get it. I don't know where they here we go. Uh, rarity seven. Let's see, rarity seven, rarity seven, rarity seven. Um. Ooh, could be uh, something cool. And this is where, you know, let's see what we got here. Oh, it could be sanctified robes. Ooh, that's kind of cool. Um, We will say that they gave me, um, as a gift, you know, some sort of really cool uh, you know, ceremonial, ceremonial katana that is blessed with a fire kami's spirit. All right. We can go into that later, but, uh, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. How would your character's parents describe them? Well, my father is dead. Um... So uh, additionally, gain one rank 
of one skill in which your character has zero ranks and determine whether your parents approve of this extracurricular interest or receive it as a regrettable deviation and why. Um, well, I would say, I think um, my uh, father wanted me to not follow him into the life of battle and death that he had. And my mother is very pro Matsu and is all about me sacrificing my life for the good of the Lion Clan. <laughs> um, and, you know, maybe I, I kind of seek, like, honor demands that my father be avenged, but I also feel like my father maybe had some weak elements to him. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, uh, you know, my, my mother is always sort of pushing me towards, you know, being this great military leader. Um, and so, you know, I pick up a, I pick up a rank in, um, uh, let's just say, uh, you know, government. We'll just make that plus one government. Um, because, you know, she wanted me to be this great, awesome uh, leader. Who was your character named to honor? Uh, when receiving or choosing a name at the coming of ceremony, many samurai adopt a name that honors a recently or particularly noteworthy ancestor in the Emerald Empire using a portion of the ancestral name combined with other symbols to change the meaning is very common practice. So who was I uh, uh, chosen to honor? Um, I was named after Matsu. Um, uh, let's say... Kagi? I don't think I have. Um, and Matsu Akage was a great Matsu warrior, strategist, um, who fought many duels and won many battles. Um, and... We get to roll on the Samurai Heritage Table. This is kind of a cool, random, unique effect uh, that you kind of roll randomly to determine uh, how your character uh, results uh, from their stuff. So let's, uh, let's get a D10. Okay, here we go. We got a D10. All right. All right, we got a three. Oh, okay, maybe this changes things. Okay, wondrous work. One of your ancestors crafted a piece of great booty that won renown for your families, and other expect, others expect you to live up to that legacy. Okay, so now we're maybe we get back to where my father came from. So sometimes you got to go back, right? So maybe uh, Matsu Akage was a great uh, swordsmith. And my father wanted me to follow in that you know, in that process as well. And then we increase our glory by five. Sweet. And then, plus five glory. And then we roll another D10 here to determine an art arson skill. Oh, I rolled anyways. Uh, okay, well, cool. <laughs> All right, I gained nine. So plus, plus, <laughs> plus one smithing. That's funny that, oh, we got that anyways. Okay, so our character, uh, you know, I was supposed to write that there. But yeah, so our character was named after this great, incredible swordsmith. And our father was a swordsmith. Man, I, I didn't even mean for this to happen. But this really is like an Inigo Montoya, right? His father, his father was a swordsmith. And then he got killed. And then his son took him up and challenged his murderer. Okay, I didn't mean for this to happen. But it's a great example of how you could just take something from our modern day thing and just turn it into a samurai uh, uh, thing and have a really cool, interesting story. So there you go. Samurai heritage, uh, Inigo Montoya. See Inigo Montoya, okay? And my father wanted me to be, you know, this follow in his footsteps and be a great swordsmith. But my mother wanted me to be a Matsu warrior and die on the battlefield like everybody else. And then my father died he could make swords, but he couldn't wield them well. And I vowed I would not be weak like him. I would honor, you know, and then Kakita um, Hatsu or whatever 
took the sword because it was such a beautiful sword. And as I, that's that's my that's my family's birthright. I'll be damned if any Kakita is going to get their hands on my father's sword. And so now I want to go and retrieve the sword for my family's honor because it's been completely disdained. My father died. His work, his katana was stolen. Uh, and the Kakita views that as his rightful honor, you know, as rightful prize for defeating my character. So what is my character's actual name? Um, page 95, I think. Uh, not, not five, 95. Um, after you've chosen the name of your ancestor, your character honors, choose the personal deri name derived from it that your character is to know, you need to know by. It might be the same name or an alteration with significance to your character. So my character's actual name is Matsu, um, Matsu Akago. So that is my name, Akago. So remember in, uh, Legend of Five Rings, Japanese culture, uh, the last name goes first. So my family name is Matsu, but my character's name is Akago, named after the legendary swordsmith Matsu Akage. Lastly, question 10, 20. Completely bullshit, uh, completely fluffy bullshit. This has no mechanical effect on your character. How should your character die? And look how much space they give your, you here. Um, and I'll just read this. All proper samurai fully expect to die in the service of their lord. And it is said that every samurai lives at all times three feet from death, the length of a katana blade. However, some deaths have more meaning than others, and there are plenty of samurai whose outward facade of courage hides a deep-seated fear of mortality. How would you like your character to end? Will they fulfill their destiny and join their ancestors in Yomi, the realm of sacred ancestors? Or will their soul be forced to undertake another cycle on the celestial wheel of incarnation? This has no mechanical implications, but you should keep it in mind, your GM certainly will. Um, so, I think my character should die um... You know, after, uh, you know, after defeating his uh, Kakita foe and recovering his family's honor by retrieving his father's sword and slaying his killer, uh, Matsu Akogo. should die like all proper Matsu warriors should in battle with his father's sword against a worthy enemy on the field of battle and uh, yeah and that's that's our Legend of the Five Rings character um, it's obviously a uh, involved process. I mean, so is picking, you know, 47 feet, I guess. Um, and it's definitely an area where people can go into as much depth as they want. But I really think that it gains its advantage when you, uh, or really gains its strength when you sit down with a group of like-minded individuals and you can bounce all these ideas back and forth on it. Let's, let's actually figure out our character real quick here. So we got plus one water... So we have two water. Okay. Oh, we've got plus one earth, plus one earth. So three earth, three fire. Right? That's it. Uh, we've got five glory, ten honor, and... Another five glory. So plus 10 glory, plus 10 honor. Is that right? Damn. We sweet. All right. So our character's uh, starting glory was 44. So our character actually starts with a 54. And our character's starting honor was 55. And their starting honor is 65. So our character's almost... And the in the great honored status, um, because you know again they're 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 kind of being a samurai samurai right. They're doing everything that's expected of them, uh, with their family, their clan, their school. Um, let's see, we've got uh, two ranks in command, and we've got one rank in martial arts melee and one rank in martial arts unarmed 
and one in tactics. And one, two in fitness, and one in labor. And uh, we got a couple, we, we, we would also write down here on our sheet a couple of our distinctions, like our quick reflexes. And uh, what was our other one? Keen sight. Um, sworn enemy. Passions tea ceremony. What is it? Impatient? Did we say our character was? Impatience. Yep. Um, and also, by the way, point out a couple of things here. Like, you know, for our quick reflexes and our keen sight, these these tie to our fire and water checks. Fire and water checks are both pretty good for us, especially our fire checks. These are things that we're going to be using a lot. And so being able to rely on these to then reroll up to two dice could be very, very important to us. Same thing. Sworn enemy and impatience are both tied to earth, something that we're three ranks in. So we're probably gonna be using earth a lot. And this is actually a good thing because number one, it makes our character very interesting, but also it means that there's a great opportunity for us to earn void points. Again, um, anytime our anxiety or our adversity comes up, yeah, it's gonna suck. It's gonna you know potentially hurt our character, but it's also going to get us void points. It's a great way for us to sort of not only make our character interesting, but it's also a great way for us to gain the sort of, uh, you know, um, abilities and, uh, uh, sorry, void points so that we can do really cool things when we need to. Um, one last thing I want to talk about here real quick, um, is experience. So the way that Legend of the Five Rings works as written, um, you just gain experience points every session. Um, you gain a couple bonus experience points if you achieve major goals, but it doesn't really actually matter what you do. It's usually one XP per hour played. So if you play a four-hour session of Legend of the Five Rings, you're going to gain four XP. It doesn't matter if you fought a massive battle against a thousand samurai or if you sat around talking about the best kind of tea. You know, was it crab tea or was it uh, dragon tea? Who made better tea, the dragon clan or the crab clan? It doesn't matter. And I always say that what whatever rewards, you know, whatever the, however the game rewards you should tell you a lot about this game. As written, this game is telling you something really important. Now, by the way, for a certain type of campaign, I might house rule that. But as written, this game is telling you that this game is there for you and your friends to sort of chew on the scenery. That you shouldn't feel focused. That you're there to experience this samurai world and you shouldn't be so obsessed with you know achieving victories or achieving goals or quests just to get experience points you gain experience points by playing the game this is the game's way of saying that the way that you gain experience is just by playing so so do whatever is going to come it doesn't matter if your character's all stressed stressed out and can't function as long as it's interesting because at the end of the session you're going to get four experience points no matter what whether you do anything or don't do anything. Yeah, you might occasionally gain a bonus experience point here and there. I mean, the game even goes so far as to tell you there are three main types of scene in the game. There are conflict scenes where you're rolling initiative, a lot of dice rolls, you know, social combat, duels, skirmishes, mass combat. Those are called conflict scenes, right? Where there is a side and another side or maybe a third side and they all want something and it's a directly opposed and you're making a lot of checks. Those are called conflict scenes, right? Those are the, the bread and butter of that. The second type of scene is called a narrative scene. A narrative scene, and you can even see here, this is called the narrative mode. And then this side of your sheet is called the conflict mode, okay? In the narrative mode, right, we're just making checks. We're doing things. We're exploring the space. We're talking. We're probably doing a fair amount of conversation or world building. Uh, and checks are going to definitely be made. 
The third type of scene, though, is called the downtime scene. And a downtime scene can be anywhere from several days to even several months to even several years. And the game even says that, you know, if, uh, you know, the group, uh, you know, let's say it's a war campaign and in Rokugan, people do not battle in the winter. Uh, you can't fight heavy snows, shitty weather. You can't, it's just no good. And so the, you know, the fall season comes to an end and the GM says, you know, we're going to skip over winter. Uh, winter is usually a time for politics and uh, court intrigue. And that's not a part of what we want to do for our campaign. Maybe you do and you want to play that. But the GM says, guys, uh, we're going to skip forward to spring of the next year. So like four months have happened. And by the way, this is a rule. This is in the game. Uh, quickly go around uh, and describe basically what your character did over the winter. And everybody gain five XP uh, or 10 XP to just rep and then spend it on stuff to represent basically what your character was doing over the course of of the winner because picking up uh, like a new technique or a new kata, like a new uh, a suji or a new invocation, which is a spell is only three experience points and gaining a new rank and a new skill is like two experience points. Gaining a second rank is like four experience points. So you might gain three to five to six experience points every time you play this game. So you could be potentially gaining one, two to three new techniques or skills or skill increases every time you play. Things like rings are a little bit more expensive. And certainly if you want to like take something like fire to level four, uh, it could be very expensive. That's something, you know, you have to really save up for. But getting things at the lower level is very, very cheap. Um, and even more so uh, the fact that... Um, you know, these downtime situations might come up and your GM might give you experience just for that sake. Also, the samurai that we just made is sort of a relatively freshly minted samurai. The game has extensive rules in here. Let's see if they have this in the uh, back of the book. The game has extensive rules about how it's totally fine to start with more experience points, 97 or 299. Let's take a look at 299. Um, I thought they had it in here. Um, but there, there's a, a, a somewhere in here where they talk about how, like, maybe your campaign starts at 20 XP because these are seasoned samurai, you know, people who have been, you know, they're, they're in their, you know, early twenties. They're not just like teenage, freshly minted samurai. Maybe people start with 30 or 40 experience points and maybe your characters are starting off and they are great samurai maybe they they're even lesser daimyo themselves and they've already you know had several uh interesting uh, uh advantages to their you know or uh several interesting things that have happened to them and they've already gained a fair amount of renown the game is totally fine with you playing essentially quote unquote a higher level character if that's the kind of samurai drama that you want to do if you want to play a game about you know freshly minted samurai trying to make their mark in the world great Boom, do it. But if you want to play a political intrigue game Combat where you are all... Bush tip hey, CMB! Great stream. Love seeing the L5R content. Thank you, Combat Medic Bush. Appreciate the tip. Um, glad you enjoyed it. I know this was probably kind of boring if you don't really like Legend of the Five Rings, but um, it just shows to me... When I, one of the things that... Important takeaway from this game is look how the narrative and the mechanical elements yin and yang to each other, right? You're not just making all this fluffy bullshit time up just to make it up and to write it down to your character sheet and no one will care. You're writing it down and you're including it, which is great, but it also has this mechanical benefit and it feeds back into the system of honor and glory and status and your rings and your distinctions. By the way, we talked about these distinctions. Remember, some of these things can just happen during the game. You know, we didn't really get into it, but like some of the disadvantages that your character can acquire during the course of the game are, you know, things like... Um, getting uh, hurt, right? Um, and so like, for example, you might end up with, uh, uh, you know, a lost arm or lost hand. Well, why would I ever choose that? You wouldn't. But if the GM rules that you fought in a duel and your character lost their left hand or right hand, Jamie Lannister style, then guess what? <laughs> you, just, you just got yourself a new, a new disadvantage. 
All right? <laughs> and you're going to go to your character sheet, and you're going to be like, okay, I've got myself a new adversity. Uh, lost <laughs> lost armor, hand, lost hand. Uh, and, you know, it, it basically says, you have only one usable hand or arm. You cannot wield anything in a two-handed grip or hold anything in your missing hand. If you are missing only the hand, you can strap items to the hand for use. Whenever you make a check for which having two hands is very valuable, uh, you have to re-roll two of your successful dice and take the lower, take the worse, right? And why? how did I gain that? Well, maybe you gained that because someone critically hit you and they cut off your fucking hand. Like, I'm sorry, that's it. There's no regenerate spell. There's no healing. There's no hit points. If you get, if you get critically hit with a katana, you're probably losing something, right? Um, same thing with the distinctions as well. You know, if your character, uh, you know, gains a distinction, like, uh, you know, gains an ally amongst the unicorn clan, because that's what happened in the story. In the story, the lion seek you know they you end up in this combat mission with a unicorn and you end up finding a, 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 a kindred souls and you make great allies amongst the unicorn by defending them in an ambush and they honor you by making them you know a temporary member of their clan and you come away with this and you you know you're like oh yeah i, I have friends amongst the unicorn clan guess what you can write you can come in here and write uh you know friends among unicorn clan and, it, you know, probably relates to water checks because that has to do with, you know, uh, being nice and talking to people and making, you know, uh, friendly uh, gestures. But I didn't pay for that with points. You can't buy these with points. You have to just acquire them through playing the game. And there's no limit to the number of distinctions or adversities that your character can have. I think the game might limit you to like two or three passions or like, look, if you have more than two or three passions, are they really passions? Um, but yeah, I mean, like, this is just awesome things that your character uh, can acquire. And and your character becomes like a living record of all of the things that they have been through. All of the honor and the glory and the status changes as their character. We didn't even cover titles, but your character can acquire new titles, which gives you access to new abilities and can raise your status, right? Maybe your character is named a provincial lord or a magistrate of the, of the eastern lands, Um is a title that has mechanical benefits and it could increase your character's status. And maybe your character is becoming a great and powerful samurai, but maybe your character isn't chasing status. Maybe they only want glory or maybe they don't care about any of this. They just want enlightenment, right? It's, it's really a true role-playing game in the truest of sense. So, um, so that is, uh, that is the ballad. That is the tale of, uh, of Matsu, Ako uh, Matsu Akogo. Akogo, Aka, uh, Matsu Akage, Matsu Akogo, Akogo, Akogo. Okay, Matsu. Matsu Akago, Matsu Akago. There we go. I was having a hard time saying it. Matsu Akago. Um, player name, of course, is yours truly. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, who knows? Will, will we ever see the, 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 Adventures of Matsu Akago? Well, yeah, probably not. But that is a Legend of Five Rings character. And, um, you know, that's kind of the general process of going through it. It's a very in-depth, intrinsic game that if you want to build a lot of really cool, interesting lore into your character, you're kind of rewarded for doing so. And, uh, and I really like that about the game. So that is going to wrap it up for us tonight. So I uh, hope you enjoyed this kind of in-depth look at making a Legend of the Five Rings character. Um, if you have any thoughts or comments or questions, leave a comment below. Or better yet, join our Patreon, patreon.com slash nice last call. And you can ask me the question right there. We have a Legend of the Five Rings channel set up, uh, along with channels for Pathfinder 2, Dungeons and Dragons, Blades in the Dark, Call of Cthulhu, you name it. We love talking about other games there. We love buying and playing all these games. Uh, we'd love for you to come and tell us about your favorite game and why we should all buy it. And then watch in amazement as we all probably go out and buy it. Um, but uh, love hanging out with everybody. Love having you here. And uh, hope you all have a really, really excellent weekend. And uh, we'll see you next time on Nights of Last Call.